to Tavern Talks. Uh, this is the first of many, we hope, many casts. Uh, this comes out of Ch Chili's Tavern Discord, and uh, we look to be doing this every month. As such, we will be uh, watching to see who's logging on, who's giving us feedback, what we can change to improve it. And we'll be talking about many different subjects. Uh, biggest news, new games, recap on some of the major titles that are out there as they're being developed. And we'll be talking about PC tech, which includes hardware and software, things that are out there. But also we'll be covering other nifty pieces of tech. So maybe it's car tech or maybe it's um, a new refrigerator or a new uh, smoothie maker. Who knows? Um, at the end of every cast, we'll go ahead and do a Q&A session where you guys can ask questions in the Tavern's actual chat channel or even here in the stream. We'll try to get to those real quick. And then we'll wrap it up with a giveaway. This month we have three of those giveaways. Um, we're going to do a Corsair triple pack of ML120 RGB magnetic levitation fans for your PC. And these are RGB, so they come with a controller. You can pick some really nice rainbow effect or pulsing or they get they turn red when they get hot. Who knows? Uh, also, we'll be giving away a $50 stream gift card. Uh, so you, you, Sorry, Steam gift card so that you can buy your favorite title. Maybe it's an upcoming title that we're going to review and that you'll uh, be saving just up, saving up just for that. There are some pretty good titles coming real soon here. We'll be talking about those a little bit later. And finally, we're going to give away a Metro Redux bundle. So Metro is one of the titles we are definitely going to be reviewing, and it's got a uh, new release coming out. It seems to be a pretty fun game. Obviously, it's not an MMO, but uh, can be enjoyable. And if you haven't played it, we're going to go ahead and get you set up with the uh, first two editions of it so that you can go into the third edition on release ready to go. So with that, I would definitely like to introduce both Okies and Triad, my co-hosts, and we'll get right into... Oh, actually, what, one more thing here, guys, before you get started with me. Um, the giveaway. So the giveaway, you will be required to watch some clues during this actual show. I'll go ahead and put up the first clue. That is very, very evident what the clue is. Um, and you need to be watching for two more. They're going to be pretty evident too. However, you got to do what the clues say to be able to enter. It's on you to enter into this particular giveaway. We're not just uh, going to do it for you this time. Won't be anything else. You won't have to sign up for anything else. You won't have to do anything else. So with that, Okies, how you doing this morning? Uh, good. Okies, In early morning. Yeah, Okies coming out of Australia. So, you know, for him, it's still pre-breakfast over there. It's like 7 in the morning. And yeah. uh, try it. How are you doing today? It's a midday for you. Yeah. No. Pretty good. Feeling excited. Ready to do this. Nice. All right, guys. Let's go ahead and get into some of this discussion about uh, what we're we're seeing this month. Um, we're going to jump right into the biggest news and get right into the uh, first thing, which is uh, CES this month. It was a, a big deal tech show for everybody. Um, CES Consumer Electronics Show uh, will demonstrate new PC technology, but also new cars, new televisions, new everything and anything. Pretty much if it's electronic, it's at this show, even stuff that you probably never want to buy. Um, one of the biggest things about this particular event was that AMD has done its first ever um, keynote speech, and they debuted some products. One of those products is the Radeon 7. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let you guys get a taste of what Radeon 7, Okies, tell me where this fits in with the cards that are out today, the cards that are coming. Give me some place to place this thing. So currently they're pushing it as a card that should be competing with the 28. But on performance-wise, we haven't seen a, a definite yet. Um, it price-wise equals the same amount, and we're hoping with the uh, new setup that it should be 
preferably even on par with with uh, tech. Nice. So you say probably fit us into a eleven sixty, the proposed eleven sixty or twenty sixty, somewhere in that range, maybe. Uh, even even closer to the twenty seventy. Nice. And we're going to see a better price point on that, right? Uh, yeah. The the difference is uh, currently we are waiting to see what PCI four will do for the car because it is PCI four enabled. Nice PCI four coming this this year, huh? Yeah, and they're saying the bandwidth might completely change the performance of it, which wasn't shown at CES, which is the thing that people were noting, that that could make a big difference. We also don't know what it's going to be like in comparison. Other systems being involved with it, like the uh, the other chipset that was shown. Excellent, excellent. And uh, another big technology that we saw AMD introduce was their new Ryzen chip. So... One of the things I wanted to show about that is how they compared to in, how they compared themselves to Intel. So with that, let's take a little look at uh, what they had to say on that subject. I was worried too. <laughs> um, but look, I know you guys well. I know the enthusiast community, and you're asking yourself, how does Ryzen really perform compared to the competition? So let's take one more look. Just one more look. Let me make sure I have my guys. Okay, you guys are there. Sit tight. Um, Lewis and Amit are from our engineering team, and uh, they've been with Ryzen um, all, all along. Uh, what we're going to show you today is now third-gen Ryzen with a head-to-head -head comparison against the top-of-the-line Core i9 9900K running the industry standards in a bench benchmark. So note, let me tell you what we're running. We're running 8-core, 16-thread Ryzen, not final frequency, early, uh, early, um, early uh, sample, and we're run, running stock frequencies of the, um, of the Intel part. So, Lewis and Amit, are you ready? Okay, let's start the demo, please. So, Cinebench is going to run for a little while. What you're also seeing, um, just so you know, are the uh, powers. These are the system powers that you see from each. And um, as I said, the image on the left is um, the competing, a competing processor. The image on the right um, is Ryzen. And what you can see, let's take a look at the Cinebench scores. Ryzen looks like 25, 2057. Our competitor is running at 2040. So um, that sounds like a win. Does it sound like a win? Um, the other thing that's really important is um, the system power. So you can see that the system power of third-gen Ryzen is running uh, actually about 30% lower than uh, of the competing system. So now you really see the power of 7 nanometer technology and what being aggressive with technology does. So thank you, Lewis and Amit. Great job. One of the things I want to note in this is that she was demonstrating <clears throat> what uh, I believe we saw was a Ryzen 5 3600 next generation, Ryzen uh, third series type of Ryzen chip. And it's eight cores and 3.6 to 4.4 gigahertz. So tell us where this stuff fits in at Okie's. Yeah, well, uh, just something that we would like to premise that was noted even in the stream um this is an engineering sample so it's not even finished and it beat the, one of the highest tier cards at the, uh, the chips at the moment so so it, it already is on par with a chip that's out that's what three times its price right um there, there are other factors that we haven't got yet but this is supposed to be the low tier for gamers was the way it was uh, interred to me because there looks like there might be lower chips after this but these are the current ones that they're going to focus on for gamers directly well uh triad you know at 179 dollars <throat> which i'm sure is a suggested price i don't know that we have the uh, final pricing on these SKUs. might that get you to come come off your intel on your next build and maybe look at amd as a uh, potential oh absolutely and from everything that i've been hearing about amd chips over the past you know a couple of years or so is that they've actually been 
growing steadily in performance and also kind of reducing some of the major problems that I've seen with it where things like heat generation, where these things could generate, you know, like a lot of heat drawn, like, you know, a lot of power and all this, and mainly just kind of be more of like the, the mid end gaming chips. I could definitely see myself, you know, jumping ship off the Intel and even with the, um, any with our, with our new, newer graphics card jumping off the NVIDIA bandwagon and possibly jumping on to these for my next yeah. gaming PC. You know, with, with the advent of uh, PCIe 4, which I'm sure, you know, NVIDIA and Intel are going to be supporting it too, but thinking about the Ryzen uh, 5 or 7 series chip at a great price point, add to that and a Radeon 7 and, you know, this spooky other ghost card we don't know about, Navi, and uh, thinking how those will work together you know, part, paired into a motherboard that's got that PCI 4, we might see drastically lower prices for today and higher quality gaming rigs, meaning things that are just, you know, keeping us up there at the high hertz and the, and the high frame rates on games that are very difficult to draw into. Some of the new games we'll be talking about very soon here. So, uh, you know what, let's start talking about some of those games. Let's go ahead and move on into the gaming industry as a whole. One of those things about the gaming industry, one of the subjects that I personally picked up, was uh, a new technology that everybody's coming into, Shadow PC being one of those technologies. Now, Shadow PC and other technologies that are debuting like this, which affect both consoles, and uh, Okies, I'll let you talk about that here in a minute, and also affect um, not just coming from this product line, but other major companies like Google, allow you to basically remote control a PC and play a game at full speed even though you're coming at it from a tablet or a television that's enabled with Android or your phone. In fact, here's a little tidbit about it. I've got a video to show you guys. So there you got a $35 a month PC, right? And you remote control it. And what they're giving you is a high-end dedicated NVIDIA graphics card. It's a 10, uh, GTX 1080 equivalent. And I've personally been using this product, and we have one of our members at the Tavern who's been using it for a good month solid here on a pretty broke-down 10-year-old computer. Uh, I even have a family member that's been using it for several months, the one that introduced it to me. In all cases, the amount of memory they give, 12 gigs of memory, is something that they're going to be stepping up and they've heard feedback on, but it works fine so far. The 256 gigabyte dedicated storage feels like SSD. It loads pretty quick and very ripping internet connection for it. You get a true Windows 10 desktop. You can load the game of your choice. I mean, until you fill up the drive, you can load whatever apps you want. So here you've got $35 a month. It would take you three years to get over $1,000 worth of input from it. And... What you have is a monster PC. I mean, it's a 1080 equivalent, and you're running it on nothing. So, you know, the technology works. It's new. The industry is doing something with this. And as far as I know, it's also going to be a portion of sort of uh, the new Xbox stuff. Tell me about that, Okies. Uh, yes, we, we can't confirm yet only because they have, they've been denying a few things currently, but they're supposed to be a rumored streaming version of the uh, X, the new next generation one where you were going to have a hard drive and then the essentially what you get with this Steam service, the stream service, which is a box to transmit the data and all the rest is going to be done on their end this time, meaning that the box won't actually need to be upgraded from now on, which means it will be a, um, a a way for them to get the leg up in the industry where you don't need to replace the, the hardware then, which means they can continuously keep uh, the next generation of gaming going without having to have people buy the next generation of console. Yeah, in fact, that might be a little add-on sale for some of these uh, games that are coming out saying, hey, you know, we, we have a PC requirement that's pretty high and... You know, an alternative, if you can't afford to upgrade your machine, is go ahead and jump onto a Shadow PC or some equivalent service and come play our game because it'll work over there. So, yeah, it's a pretty hot little trick. 
which I now can confirm because I had to wait until they announced it. Uh, Ubisoft are actually one of the ones sponsoring this. It is now live on their launcher to promote people to go to this service if you're in New uh, if you're in uh, America currently until they spread out across the world. And again, if you guys want to try it out, it does actually work. It is a very live system. I have played Star Citizen. I have played uh, Elite Dangerous, both in it. I know that a friend of ours here at the Tavern is playing uh, Black Desert Online in it. And these are all graphically intensive games. And the the lag issue and everything that you might think of, it doesn't exist. They truly have it uh, part out. There are some great review videos out there. Linus Tech Tips does a great review on it. Shows you how you can jump between the equipment, what have you. So give it a look. It's 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 a worthy thing. I mean, it won't do multi-screens. It doesn't do VR, so don't, don't expect those types of things. The latency is too much for VR, even if it's 2 milliseconds. Now, 2 milliseconds, you wouldn't notice playing, you know, 144 hertz full frame rate in Star Citizen, but VR will suffer a little bit there. And if you're like me, where you got to have three monitors, then no, it's a single monitor solution. But there's some cool things that you can do with that. So watch for that technology. However... There was a note pointed out to us too that you can run a computer and then have it maybe as a mid-tier or low-tier computer and stream the service onto that computer. So you can still have multi-monitor, just it will not work on all three monitors to you control know, the powerful PC. You you brought up a good subject, and that's stream. You People who like to do streaming, which, you know, obviously this is my first few attempts here. Um, but that was one of the things too, is you always have to have, or they recommend that second PC for streaming. Well, there you go. You can be playing the game in a shadow PC and then using your computer to stream and dedicate that local machine for that purpose. So in any case, there's a lot of benefits. It's worth checking out. Um, no, I'm not going to promote my own you know, referral code. I'll let you guys do that for yourselves. And in any case, so that's enough on that technology. I think it's, it's worthy. It's why I picked it up. And uh, you guys should check it out if you're running a lower end system. You want to wait the rest of the year to build a, a new AMD, very powerful PC. This is something that could hold you over in the meantime. Um, so, Triad, you wanted to talk about some Blizzard stuff. So, I think we've oh got some Blizzard. Oh, boy, stuff. Blizzard. Right? And uh, in that, I think you had a pretty interesting little comment video. So, let me go ahead and put that out there. Thank you. Hey, uh, just was wondering, is this uh, an out-of-season April Fool's joke? <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's a fully... Uh, fully. So, is it an out-of-season April Fool's joke? Uh, Activision Blizzard, so much to cover here. So, go ahead, Triad. Oh, man, where do I even begin? Where do any of us begin? Where are we ending with this, right? I, I don't know, and it scares me, because, I mean, you, you look at this company, you look at Blizzard, you, you, you look at what they did initially. They, they started off making games, I think they made a game for the SNES back in the day. It was like, it was, uh, it was a top-down racing game for the SNES, and I, I don't remember the name of it offhand. Rock and Roll Racing. Rock, Rock and Roll racing, racing, that's what it was. So they made that game. And they weren't called Blizzard back at the time, but, you know, it's just these guys just making a game, you know, back when, you know, making games for these different consoles were, you know, it was kind of new, kind of a interesting take on, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. And then after that, I don't remember if they came out with, I forget if they came out with anything else. I think they came out with either a pinball game or a billiards game after that. But sometime after they came out with their first, I believe it was for PC, uh, The Lost Vikings. And that was one of their, I think, first forays into their own self-published, uh, their own self-published games. And it was, you know, just they're just the first attempt. Still brand new company, still early and young, but it, it did decently. Uh, I don't think it was a success by any large metric, but it wasn't like a f complete failure. And it was fun. It had an interesting take. And then, you know. From there on, we jump into the series Orcs that everybody knows humans, and loves. Baby. Orcs versus Humans, the I first can't. Warcraft game. I played the hell out of that. Yeah, I unfortunately never had the pleasure of playing those earlier Warcraft games, but that started to skyrocket Blizzard just past yeah, Massive else. amounts of people playing. It was it was a really great strategy game. I mean, I, I couldn't get enough time on that game. Oh, yeah. And, 
then Diablo 1 come out and it set the bar for RPGs for a while. Yeah, with oh, yeah. randomized dungeons. I mean, that just blew us away. We could jump in and out multiplayer. It was really slick. So, you have these awesome games that come out. Blizzard continues to ride on these coattails. They come out after that with, you know, Warcraft 2, uh, Tides of Darkness. They come out with uh, Diablo 2. And then they come out with, you know, they, they, they thought they were going to make like a sci-fi version of Warcraft. People didn't like it, so they went back to the jarring drawing board, made it a brand new game and came out with Starcraft. You know, and then you have, then you start bringing in all this other stuff. You start, Then you go to Warcraft 3, you go to, then we have WoW, well, we was, have There was Starcraft. one thing to note too, just not on top of games, but they also were the ones who developed one of the first transfer game development systems, a launcher and an in-game app, which was better. It's the standard a lot of companies run by now with their own version. Setting the bar at multiple levels of the industry. Launchers, games, online game by, by no doubt, right? World of Warcraft, the de facto standard largest game to date. They, they just had it all. Yep. They continue to snowball up. At one point, I think the highest numbers for World of Warcraft was somewhere in the 14 millions of people yep. playing their game. You had everybody coming to them when you thought i remember reading a comment somewhere i think it was on reddit somebody made the comment that the games that they used to play, that he used to play for blizzard when you bought a blizzard game you knew that you were getting experience no matter what the genre was no matter if it was rts rpg shooter racing no matter what it was whatever they came out with you knew you were in for something truly special so it was almost like an event to buy this game heck yeah it was it was a great time and, you know, and the funny thing is, is like, you know, so they, they definitely had some hiccups. You know, they, 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 they did some things like with WoW, they, you know, they started to tone down some of the difficulties of it to bring it into a more mass market, which is understandable. You know, they, they start, they continue going down this path of trying to continue to grow and expand their games to continue reaching this larger and larger audience because you're, it's a rapidly growing company and it became the, one of the biggest gaming companies on the planet. Ah, uh, but with the rise comes the fall. So why are we talking about them today? Since we all know about how great they are. Why are they a hot topic today? So we all know that at some point they merged with Activision and they became sort of an Activision Blizzard partnership. They weren't truly merged, but you knew there was going to be something going on there. So there were rumors floating around that Blizzard had been working on a game called Titan. Project Titan. It was supposed to be this next-gen MMO. It was supposed to be huge. It was supposed to be great. But some of the information had come out that they had had to cancel it because it just wasn't, they weren't making any money off of it and it was costing them billions. So they had to go and nix it and the game that we got out of it was Overwatch. Hmm. It was fair enough. We got our we got our really cool, you know, arena shooter. Blizzard's still pretty much the king of making games. You have everything that they're coming out with aside from like, you know, every, every other WoW expansion being a pretty good testament to their continued success as a gaming industry titan. And then I I don't know what happened. We got well, we we starting last year. They launched Battle for Azeroth, their their latest WoW expansion. Wasn't that great. Had some cool things. You saw a lot of people coming back and playing it. You still had strong with the Overwatch. They were still committed to making what is essentially the NFL for Overwatch, making Overwatch into a massive esport. They're still committed to Heroes of the Storm, making that into a great MOBA. They have, you know, we've got rumors of, you know, Warcraft 3 remastered on the horizon. You know, we have all this stuff. And then, you know, BlizzCon happens. Mm -hmm. And I I just, I don't know what happened. It, well, they one of went the things from... is like, didn't they say something about mobile? Ah, uh, mobile. My arch nemesis. <laughs> Okies, you seem to know also a lot about this subject. Um, I think you've got a little bit more information for us when it comes to this little mobile well, switch. This, this that little downfall decision making. I, there, there's lots I could talk about when it comes to this. Being someone who used to ha who have friends there and who pe people in the industry who used to refer to Blizzard as the ivory tower of gaming. Uh, since since the launch of World of Warcraft, they had a lot of issues, and they were slowly going. They seeked out Vivendi as a investor who helped them out. Uh, in two thousand and eight, that investor changed to Activision. 
By 2014, the company had transferred a chunk of its control to Activision itself, which essentially was removing some of the figureheads of the company. Uh, and that time would go in a transition period from 2014 to 2018, which we saw uh, over the years a large chunk of the figureheads and senior staff leave the company. Uh, at those points, you could start to see where Activision were now making more active decisions. They, they Activision were the ones who cancelled the time, not not the company. Like Blizzard didn't want to cancel. It. Yeah, the reins behind wanted... the scenes had been transferred to someone else. And and that that was where the first inkling of the trickle down of what I still call because I'm not a fan of them uh, greed in in Activision's where they prefer immediate money over a good development of a game well for the so, for the longest time you know it was who's going to take wow down right it was always the the unspoken word or the very spoken word of you know this is the next wow killer or what's going to be the next wow killer and it's pretty safe to say nothing was the wow killer except for blizzard activision and blizzard together they seem to have taken themselves out of the picture in fact we have a slide up for a little while now called uh, activision blizzard's new cfo is doing that, awards. Um, what is this about? That, so th there's been there's been a thing that that is this is where I was a bit uh, when, when Tri was talking. A lot of the games um, over the last uh, six months has, has been proven that a lot of the teams have been cut down in size. They're now skeleton crews of their former teams because Activision is pushing to save money, and that's where this controversy has come in at the start of the year, where we had. Uh, a CFO who, this is the current CFO, Dennis, was the CFO back then, uh, about a year ago, was replaced by a new CFO who has now left the company to go work for Netflix. Hmm. Uh, during the time where they're talking about being low on funds, they do something like this, where they give him a signing bonus of $15 million, and it, it, it even states there at the bottom, that's on top of the $900,000 salary and a target bonus of $1.35 million. Nuts. I'm cutting costs, but at the same time, I'm giving a ton of money away. This uh, is on top of the heels of uh, reports that happened in December, which was the staff complaining that they've had to go into shared accommodation with other staff members from the company because they're not paid enough. Wow. And well, I definitely think that, wow, wow, Blizzard... EA are looking at, uh, or Activision, right? Um, not Electronic Arts, my bad. Activision and Blizzard are looking at rolling up a nice little downfall for them. But what about this mobile thing that I heard at their latest announcement? Oh, so the company has decided because of the shift in the marketplace where all those this shadow players come out, a lot of people cannot afford the highest top tier PCs anymore. A chunk of the market is either console or the biggest chunk of the market nowadays is mobile phones. Hmm. And now and, it's it's getting worse. They're under an investigation for securities fraud. Oh, uh, what? This, what? This this goes hand in hand with uh, the next slide as well. But there there's been a thing that they're saying that it's a questionable law firm. But at the same time, other people have had this same question as investors that I know that. Blizzard didn't tell people that they were separating from Bungie, which tanked their share price. Hmm. So, so the people who were invested, who were part of the company, sold out their share price at a, at a higher amount to then rebuy it once the announcement was made and the price dropped down again, Ooh. which is in, Ooh. insider trading. That's, yeah. Um, yeah that's, but, uh, that's... Now, don't get me wrong. I'm somebody here that loves Destiny. I love Bungie. Because I've played, I've played, I don't know how many hundreds of hours in Destiny One and Two. So I was really happy when I saw the news that they were splitting, and it was just a clean split. But I gotta, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I can totally feel for these investors, and that not getting that information up front that you were going to cut off one of your big whales mm -hmm. from your company. Oh, that is, and then to turn around and profit off of it, you know that that's landed a few notable. <clears throat> people out of Hollywood and what have you in jail for doing very similar yeah. things. <laughs> they, and like, and this even on, on a, it was a happy note, but also a somber note when people found out where this other investment come from for Bungie. Um, they're looking at self publishing the next version of destiny without any hands involved from other companies this time. 
yeah as as the splits happen new things can come of it so yeah one of the things that we have touched on here is mobile gaming and okies i know that you got a personal little vendetta here so let's just show a little bit about that right now these are the mobile games that are coming out and i'm just doing a little uh, slideshow here diablo and a few others some are to be loved some are not to be loved i mean it just depends on who you are and whether or not you like mobile gaming right so i personally have a couple that i'm very much going to be watching for oh look there's a clue anybody who's watching pay attention to the clue We'll go ahead and let that spin back around. That'll come back to you guys. In any case, a couple of the games I'm looking for. Maybe Command & Conquer. That certainly might be something. I think I might steer clear of the Diablo one. And then I'm also looking at Blades. Blades looks to be a good one. What do you think, Oki, about this whole mobile push? Mobile gaming as a whole, I don't mind because it is a genre that's coming out as as a big thing now but it's it's the shift in focus from some companies where they've just dropped their entire franchise into being mobile heavy and the push that because investors have realized that they're uh, from from a, a return i got the other day from an investor uh said that they, they were told that in certain companies they've been told that there is a 2.5 billion player base just on mobile hmm. so so if if something like Diablo can it get even, you know, a a ten percent of that market, they're already getting way more than any other game they've ever published. Right. And and some of these games like Blades being a new uh, multi platform, so it's it is a mobile designed game. But what they uh, promised us was that you can you know be playing right along, step right off of that to your tablet, step right off of that to your PC. And it keeps it consistent, obviously, because it's which, being hosted to their server. Which, which is done right, and that, that's that's the point that a lot of people made. That if Diablo and, more, and some of these other games were on more than just the phone, focusing on only the phone, people could understand because then it's a shared environment. But by focusing wholly on the phones, a lot of people have noticed that it comes hand in hand with microtransactions. Yeah, and a, a lot of companies do that. Now, there's already been a leak. Uh, uh, how there's uh, Diablo might be having a microtransaction for upgrading items in the, the thing that based the game on grinding and being able to play the game repeatedly is now going to be something you can purchase in the game at, I think they said it was roughly $3. Um, mm. In that market for share, like that sounds really greedy, but if you're an investor, that they're talking that's, you know, $90, $100 billion a year. Yeah, and that's so, a... So it, that's a serious market to be tapping into, but which, on the, well, go ahead. Sorry, which which is good in the in the interest of a company and making other games, but it's the it's the narrow-minded tunnel vision of this is all we're working on now, which is where we can push back into the point of with Diablo. Uh, Blizzard have now said that they are almost wholly focusing on just mobile games. They've got I think it's sixty-five to to eighty percent, depending on the numbers we check of their staff are just working on mobile titles now in my opinion that does fit a market it does not fit all markets in fact triad one of the slide sets that are here is about a major title and we're talking about a major game ion that undoubtedly oh yeah shook the world with its uh, mmo gameplay and what have you for them to come out and say hey look we're going to do an ion too and and Ion 2 was going to be like, oh my gosh, you know, rebirth of this product. So what every MMO game player wants out of their MMO is, you know, after 7 to 10 years, a new refresh of their game. And what did they give you, Triad? They gave us a steaming pile of mobile. <laughs> Just pure, unadulterated mobile. <laughs> and the sad part is, is that, you know, the funny thing is, is that I remember when the announcement for Ion 2 hit, you know, a friend of mine that some of you from the tavern may know, son of Anubis. Mm -hmm. We were sitting there watching the announce or saw the announcement for Ion Two, and you know we got super excited because we were playing Ion at the time because they had just come out with that new patch. The uh, I believe it was the six point patch that like kind of refreshed the main game itself. Yep. And we were like, oh, this is awesome. So we, you know we'll play this for a little bit, and then when Ion Two comes out in a year or two, we'll switch to that, and we'll you know we'll I'll, we'll totally get into it. And it was sounding like from everything that I had heard. 
you know, this was going to be all of the modern MMO stuff, you know, that we had come to know and love. So all the all the modern features of an MMO, they would have action combat that, you know, a lot of MMOs are moving towards, which I'm actually personally a huge fan of, you know, and then you'd have the amazing flight system that originally came that Ion came to be known for, you know, all in this brand new game. And then through digging, people had to sit there and dig through their websites to find out, oh, this is actually just a mobile title. This so they, is just. So they weren't even upfront about it. They buried the. Info, oh no. And us, oh, the no. player base, had to go out and dig that information up. Oh, pretty much. You had to go find it on like one of their blog websites that it was actually just a mobile title. That's just and ridiculous. It it killed all of the hype immediately. I remember we were looking for that information, and then like an hour later, I had to reveal that information to Son of Anubis, and we both just became so deflated. We were so excited, ready for you know this new game into the genre, and it just to turn out to be a mobile game just. Yep, hot, I don't know. Hot trash. Well, we definitely have uh, some negative feelings about mobile, that's for certain, obviously, because we're PC gamers. You know, we want to see all that power and all that beauty that, that can be the 3D realism of a PC game. And you know what? I think that we're done being negative to those guys. Let's talk about some cool stuff. Let's get into the actual games that we want to see and we want to be talking about. So with that, I'm going to introduce our play, our fan base, our viewers, the people who will be watching this even on YouTube once it's uploaded, to a game that I personally am watching very strong. Now, there's going to be a few in, the, in this set that I'm, I'm going to be watching and playing, but this is probably the number one game for me to be a participant of for a decade, easily. Let me introduce to you to uh, Robert Space Industries, um, CIG, as you'll hear it, and a game called Star Citizen. There's actually two games there. One is Squadron 42, the other one is Star Citizen, and here's a couple of introductory videos for you guys to watch. I saw you apply to the Flight Academy again. I'm your new wingman, sir. The coil. Local scum use it for cover to launch attacks. This is their turf, so move on. I love him. Keep your eyes open. No southern moves. Who the hell are you? We're OMC. And OMC belongs to Sato Khan. Is that your boss? Are we supposed to be scared of him or something? Yeah. The OMC aren't the only ones listening into comms. Attack by Vandal forces. Repeat, we are under attack. There have been battles. There have been losses. Each and every one of you has proven yourself time and again. We will not lose the system! We will not fall back!
I'll show you guys. That was Squadron 42, their single-player game, and it's an impressive thing. You, most of everything you saw there was actual in-game footage, and I know it sounds too good to be true, but I've been, been following it deeply. And with that, they just started to design an MMO, which, of course, is the bigger draw for me. However, if you play one, you can win ships for the other, so it might be worth getting into both. Let me show you a little bit about what Star Citizen looks like. This is the MMO. Citizen and Squadron 42. And Star Citizen is the MMO. And Star Citizen um, is under development. It is an alpha product right now, but it is a playable alpha. So you invest by, um, or you get into the game by buying a ship. And that package is your standard PC game type price, 45 bucks. And you get the Star Citizen product. And you can add on Squadron 42 so that when it releases, you'll get that right out of the gate. And it's like a $10 add on. The bullet points. Star Citizen is, by no doubt, a, a hugely immersive space simulation game. There's no winning to it, per se. Um, there's no leveling up. But you do level up, in a sense, by getting better ships. Ships that can mine. Ships that can salvage other ships. Medical transports. Research and, and development. Uh, fighting, obviously, combat-style stuff. It does have first person, but the biggest draw for this game when it was introduced to me by you, Triad, was the fact that you could, you know, start your game, get out, get up as your character, and you're walking around, and that's great. But you could call a ship, walk into the ship, fly off the planet into space. Okay, okay, that's great. Then you could fly across the space to another moon planet or whatever, or a space station, go down through the atmosphere, burn in the whole schmear, all realistic, uh, clouds, the whole schmear. Then it, you get down onto a base there, you get out of your ship, you go into another facility and you shoot people for a quest uh, that you're going to do, kill eight guys that are there or whatever and get the tchotchke at the end. Yippee skippy. The point is, is there was zero load time. There, There's no screen loads or what have you. And some people have countered with, well, when you quantum jump, right, that's their faster than light travel, hit it chewy, um, that that would be the equivalent to a load screen. But it isn't in fact. You can stop it at any time that you want, any point in space that you want, at random. You are actually traveling across their universe during a quantum jump. In fact, you can watch the planetary bodies go by during the QT, and you can stop it at any point, like I said. So as a massive, and we're talking about massive game, <clears throat> its universe looks to be bigger than anything that's ever been out. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then to add to that... In this massive universe, they're the first to develop an engine that can run this on even what's a current day mid-tier computer. So the way that they did that is they developed their own uh, special engine that runs on top of a major company out there. I'll let you guys talk about that a little bit more. But they've also invented a whole lot of new tools, including um, procedurally generated cities, procedurally generated moons, procedurally generated planets. So they only have to spend hours where any other developer would have to spend days or weeks to do an entire planet. And mind you, there's one moon right now you can go to, <clears throat> not even the biggest, called Daymar in this game. And 
every game made to date with every single one of their maps, including expansions and DLCs, would all fit on this moon and not even cover it. And that's just one moon. And they have uh, four moons around one planet. There's a second planet in there with another four moons. There's a third planet that's coming out shortly here. It's got a couple more moons. Diverse biomes, you know, trees versus snow versus barren, whatever. Um, and they're huge. So the scale of this thing, the enormity of it, the ability to stand in a ship with five of your buddies while it's flying through space and walk around, it's an amazing endeavor. And I have been tracking it in the last couple of years. It really is going to be a hard game to beat. What do you guys think? So, yeah, yeah no, I, I agree with you. And the funny thing is, so with everything that they're trying to put into this game, I mean, we're still we're still at least probably any at least another year or two off from full completion, full or at least beta. It it's crazy to think about, but this is a, the scale of this game is has not been done before, and if once they have everything that they're planning to have in this game, I know that there are plenty of games out there that talk about, oh, we're the Battlefield killer, we're the WoW killer, we're the this killer, the COD killer, the, the that killer. I truly believe, in every sense of the word, that this is the EVE killer, the EVE Online killer. EVE Online, uh, for those of you that don't know, I'm sure you've heard of it, but if you haven't, EVE Online is a space sim MMO that came out in the year 2004, I believe it was. Biggest, and, biggest online space MMO ever. Yep. And it has existed for a long time. And it has, if you look, read EVE Online, playing it is not necessarily like the funnest. I mean, for some people, well, no, there's other people who find it fun. A, there's not a first person aspect like star citizen b you are a ship or a group of ships i mean you're you're conducting a fleet battle that's that's or mining or what have you or oh, yeah. trade where you can do all that in star citizen but you're doing it from your character your actual personalized character street clothes combat gear flight gear you are your character in star citizen and that's a unique aspect it's even not in elite dangerous it's not in eve like that it's it's that extra layer that you know Eve Online doesn't have. Eve Online has crazy stories that come out of it, like you know corporate espionage to somebody going in and blowing up you know hundreds of thousands of real world dollars worth of ships mm -hmm. and the crazy space battles and territory battles that go on there. It's insane. And to bring that same level of scale to a game that lets you get out of your ship or to have two hundred real people aboard an actual ship moving around and interacting with with one another all real time it, it's just insane it's boggling it, this and, and it, yes you're right 200 people well we've even found that it could be more than that when you talk about its biggest ship one that you might have to find and there's a whole set of carrier class giant bigger than carrier class they're considered capital ships but they're bigger than those in this game that have to be found they have to be built and fixed and owned and you can't just buy them outright but it might take a organization as they call it guild of a couple hundred people or more just to hang on to that one ship. Yeah. They also it, they they have fighters too. So individually, you just start with your little Mustang or your, you know, Aurora, and that's you and you're going to do your thing or maybe you save up some money, you get a prospector and you go do some mining and now you're hauling in some some extra dough with uh both some package delivery and some mining and then, you know, like triad, you go into bounty hunting. What ship did you get for the bounty hunting thing? I got the Aegis Avenger Stalker because that was the bounty hunter ship that was being sold as one of the game packages at the time. And it's been an okay ship. It's not like the greatest, but it's a great little starter ship and will definitely let you kind of be a bounty hunter. But that's kind of one of the other cool aspects of this game is, yes, you get your ship to start off with because you're going to want your own personal transport to go, you know, do the things that you want to do to go, you know, so that you have your ship to get around the universe. But you don't have to fly a ship. Nope. You can be a mercenary on another bigger ship and be just, you know, a guy in a, in a military or, you know, go be a secret agent for some, you know, company's agency or whatever they set up. You can go race, sh you know, ships or vehicles. Uh, you could go... Uh, they have a whole um, news media set of ships. So you can literally oh, yeah. be a reporter streamer. You know, for you streamer guys, you can go out there and... Uh be reporting on a race or a big battle and actually have a new streaming ship and get this it streams to monitors in ships in the game so i could be tuning into your stream in the game 
and watching the race you're covering in the game, sitting in my 600i luxury cruiser, you know, that I might have, on a big screen that's down in its, in its recreation area. The amount of depth and detail is just disgusting. The medical stuff, the research stuff, the amount of um, go out and find new areas in the universe. It, it's, it's intense, and there's a ton of it. So, again, for our viewership here, and we'll see this at the tavern, we'll see this at various other places, Star Citizen is a massive game, an undertaking like nothing done to date. And what's also great about it is it's not done by EA slash, you know, Activision or Tencent or any of these other games. And they're never, they're never going to be. It's wholly owned, and it's done by the guy who made uh, Wing Commander, a person that's also done movies, Chris Roberts. He knows what he's doing. He's invested a ton of his money, effort, and time. It looks to be an excellent title, and we're going to be covering portions of it in the months to come in future talks. But another game, and I, and I want to say this in all honesty, this other game that we're going to talk about, Ashes of Creation. It's originating father, as it were, Stephen. If I could say that there was a truth that we don't know, it would be that Stephen and Chris Roberts were brothers somehow. They're long lost brothers that were separated younger in life because their development, their choice to produce a game of such uh, industry changing quality, of such industry high standards, is phenomenal. And so I want to take us into the next game, which is Ashes of Creation. The only other game, so I have just the two, Star Citizen and Ashes of Creation, that will matter. As these games come out, it's the only place you're ever going to find me. And there's a reason for the two of them. One's sci-fi, whereas Ashes of Creation is a fantasy RPG style. Ashes of Creation. Phenomenal in its, also, in, in its development, in its birth, not beholden to some big distribution company, etc. Yeah, they're doing some distribution in the U that they had to sign up a deal for, but they're not beholden to them. They actually control those guys. I'll let you talk about that, Okies, after this video. So let me introduce everybody to Ashes of Creation. Yes, you saw that the beta did start in December, and what you saw was the bulk of that was their uh, Apocalypse VR stuff with now Sieges coming online. However, it is a full MMO under development, and like Star Citizen having Squadron 42 coming out first, and a lot of those assets are being pushed over to the MMO 
for development cycle. Same thing is happening with Ashes of Creation. They have this BR, Sieges, etc. game that's out right now. Everybody come enjoy it. It is a great game, fun to play. And then those assets are being designed and developed and all that feedback's coming back from us, the community, and being pushed into that MMO. And that MMO is going to have so many more features. Okies, tell us about some of those features. <laughs> Okies? Did I lose you? There's I mean, Okies. sorry. So tell us about those features that Ash's MMO is going to produce for us. A world that's evolving based on what players yes. do? Yes. We we have a um, we're going to have a node system that will evolve with player decision and uh, be affected by what players do in the area. The um, the nodes will, in turn, depending on what you do in the node, can then uh, elicit change and push uh, the environment to even push back, where certain events can be triggered because you're doing something in the game. So you mean if I build somewhere and I chop down all the trees, all the pixies are going to come and kick my butt they could <laughs> so one of the things i know about that is in the shard as people are used to calling it on the server as i'm used to calling it if i'm in an area and i'm working with my guild and we do chop down all the trees and we get the pixies to come out we have to deal with that in that node that that event that may occur because the the world is reacting to our actions if i jump over to another server would that same thing be happening there uh, only if the same event was happening. So if you if you didn't take that city as it was, the node that could be turned into a city, the, the node could be dormant because you chose to build the city somewhere else, which means that event won't happen, and it's it's unique for every individual server at that point. So So servers won't even be the same through the development of it. They'll have their own branching destinations, so it might even be worth making a character on a server just to see a dragon that had come out. Also, their um, crafting system, not while, while not unique, will actually be probably the best implementation from what I'm reading and hearing, and they've committed to us, the players, and that is the best pieces will be made by players, period. You'll be able to find epic, like, world-class pieces that are in it, very unique, very rare, lots of effort to get it, but the bulk of us me, you know, people like me that won't go chase those super epic one, ones down, we'll get to know Triad. Triad's really great at crossbow making, and he's going to make this super epic crossbow that I can get from him. But then that is tagged by him, by his uh, account, his player, and unique in that scenario, right? So what you're saying to me is I need to go get, pick up crossbow when I go make this <laughs> game, or when I go get this game. So, yeah. so we... So with with the systems they're putting in place like that, and this is something that I push with people when I introduce them to the game, the the company, the people who make the games are industry veterans, a lot of them. They have 10 to 20 years experience in the industry. Some of them have chosen to come here because they themselves wish for a game like this that's not driven by the shareholder, the person who wants to make profit first. Yep. And, and that's what we're seeing is a change into what I consider to be proper game development. I'm going to get out of these heavy push, uh, EA, Blizzard, Tencent, on the list goes. Even Bethesda's doing this now. Many games just pushing and getting that microtransaction loot box crap and getting us back to the depth and greatness of what a game can be. Now, all developers aren't created equal, and I want to bring somebody extra into our conversation here. Also, to my viewers that are online watching live, yes, we're going to run a little long on this particular first episode because we have so much more to cover with CES. There's so many great games, and we're doing introductions that the show is going to go a little bit longer this month. Normally, we're going to be about one-hour format, give or take a few minutes. So this time, a little bit longer, but we got great stuff to get into here. One of the games that are, that are uh, out right now to play, but definitely still under development, is a game called Atlas. I'm going to bring on a friend of ours, Wools Chan. Let me get her into the conversation here, and let's talk about that. Add. There we go. Hey, Wools, how you doing? Got to, got to go hot on your mic for us. Well, I think we she just connected. Yep, she just connected. So we'll we'll get that worked out here really quick. And. Uh, 
just to double note, the um the Ashes of Creation game, they're scheduling oh, to hopefully I'm, get the I'm game ready. Go ahead, go ahead, Okies, and yes, Wolves, we got by you. the end by the end of this year, but maybe delayed if they do not believe it's ready in time, which is something that older companies used to do when it was fun to play those. Yeah, that's right. We'd rather wait and have quality than rush and have a hot mess. I agree. So. One of those things that we got to deal with is Atlas. Now, I'm going to go ahead and flip on our little Atlas slideshow here. And Wolves, thank you for joining us. We want you to tell us a bit about this game. Uh, no problem. So, as you know, it's all about, you know, basically being a pirate. So, when you uh, first log in, you're going to have a set of free ports scattered all across the map that you can choose to be at. And when you spawn in, it's basically a starter island with tons of resources. The resources respawn very fast. And the idea is you'll go up to this boat maker, you'll hand him stuff, he'll make you a boat, and you sail out, and you find an island, and then you start to make bigger boats, like sloops, schooners, brigs, and eventually galleons, which are downright massive. Uh, but it's, it's, it really doesn't have much of an end game, sort of like Star Citizen. The end game is the adventure, honestly. Well, and it's a survival type game, correct? Uh, yes. So it's you gotta, very survival. You got to pay attention to certain details like food and water, etc. Is it is it overbearing or burdensome, or is it pretty um, balanced? It's it's difficult. So if you drain all your stamina, you'll basically exchange more stamina for your food. But hmm. you can't just eat whatever you want because you have three vitamins A, B, C, and D, and you have to get from different things like. Uh, like the D vitamin is fish and milk, and oh, so specific you know others foods are very so saying. you have to have like a balanced diet. Ah, oh, nice. That's that's unique. Um, it's it's unique, but they're still trying to work out the system because it's kind of difficult. Like you you've overeaten food, but you're still neglecting on your vitamins, and kind of vice versa. Ah, so. so you could get the classic scurvy as being a pirate if you don't have enough <laughs> vitamin C. Yeah. Awesome. I'm gonna go out and get me some scurvy. <laughs> Bow legged. <laughs> So uh, you build ships, I'm assuming, yes. Yes. Excellent. And those ships are what kind of what kind of ships are these? Uh, so you have like I get you've got a couple different ships. So like first start with a with a raft, right? Like it's a basic little uh, square raft with a sail. That's kind of difficult. But the, uh, the next one is a sloop, which is almost it's about a dinghy size, but it's got two sails. It's a little bit faster. And then next up from that, you've got a schooner which uh, can hold two sails as now, well. I are, these, are these ships that you're talking about just like mine only, or do I have to have a team? Is a team capable? What's... Uh, you... So you can definitely man a sloop by yourself. You can man a schooner by yourself. I've seen people man brigs. The game tries to offer an alternative to actual players by adding in AI. Uh -huh. And uh, so the AI are your crew members. You can buy them at Freeports, where you would originally spawn in, or you'll notice, like, ships of the dam around. If you break them, there'll be, like, about three to four uh, crew members floating in the water, and if you have gold, you can pay them, and they'll join your ships. They can man your cannons, your sails, and even your steering wheel if you want them to. Nice. So I can go in there and play my own game and not have to worry about having a guild, but probably safer to have actual players manning that stuff and if, yes. I, if I get into a battle. It <laughs> yeah, is a, the AI are not the smartest. It is a PvP, <clears throat> PvE type of game, correct? Uh, yeah, of course, they have different servers for PvE and PvP. Very nice. Uh, any drawbacks that uh, you know about? Um, I know that they had a, a hard launch. I, I read some of that. It, it really news. did. They did not have um, the means to hold everybody that wanted to play on launch. And lag has been a consistent problem in the game. Like, obviously, you know, ocean waves have never been the easiest thing for, for games to render. Uh, and all the ships are very customizable. It's not it's not a base setup. So if you build a brig, you basically get like the hull of the ship, and like your decks have holes in them, and then you build around it. So like everything about every ship is extremely customizable. So it's loading in all these just very customized things. Even with blueprints, if you go out and you make tons of blueprints for your ship, now every everybody has different stats. It's it's a lot for the game to handle. Hmm. 
Well, I mean, it, for those of us that have enjoyed Conan and <clears throat> Fallout 76, <clears throat> um, it sounds like an exciting new variant to that genre of survival. It sounds like it's got a, a great amount of detail to it. Um, what's your recommendation? People should run out and grab it now or wait for some more development? What do you, what's your thoughts? I would wait for more development. I can't speak for PvE servers because I play on a PvP server. But things are already pretty well established. Um, it's also very hard to play the game because they're constantly changing new things, changing big things. Um, well, I mean, so like, uh, changing things is good. That means they're, they're developing it out. They're getting it improved, polished, etc. That's That's a good thing. Yeah, it's true. It's a good thing. But if you're looking to like play it for like a long term thing, I would wait till later once they start getting like all the bugs worked out because they're making massive changes, absolutely Fair massive. Enough. Like they noticed land raids uh, weren't going as well. They were taking too long, and within like very little heads up, they reduced the defenses of all of our bases. Um, by like they increased the damage it took by like. 2.5 times by explosives. Mm. So, like, that's a big change. It's, well, uh, it, it helps with the progression of the battle, so things keep evolving and moving. Mm-hmm. That's a good thing. But, you know, it is... I'm not going to lie. I understand the game is progressing, and I support its progression, but it is kind of frustrating in the middle of a war. You're like, all right, our defenses are good, and then all of a sudden this update happens, and you're like, I, I haven't prepared <laughs> at all, and here comes a dragon. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> and there are good animals. I mean, as we're seeing in the slides, there's a lot of depth to this. I understand the map is pretty stinking huge in the way of MMOs. It's it's a it big map. Massive. That's good mm -hmm. because nothing worse than a tiny little map. Uh, sea of Thieves. Uh, did I say that out loud? Sea of Thieves. Um, <laughs> I was actually just about to bring that up. <laughs> we're comparing it to this game. <laughs> cartoony um, MMO kind of wannabe game, which looked to be fun. I did play a bit of Sea of Thieves, but it's nothing compared to a full, huge, you know, eventually fully developed atlas style game obviously that is a true on the seas you know go get your enemies go get your better ship hit the port find the treasures etc including getting fighting and dealing with beasts on various islands different biomes snow tropical deserty and that even affects you as the weather inclement weather if you don't have the right gear on so yeah atlas is definitely on the radar coming up in the future yeah i still have an issue with it Oh well, you know it's still under development. <laughs> it, no, it's it's the it's the the lack of information for some parts. The the patch notes that weren't given out as early as they should have been. Uh, the fact that it's owned by Snail or Wildcard, but they deceptively made a new company just so they could produce the game, so people didn't have it tied to the other game they own, which is Dark and Light, which is still hmm. incomplete and still filled with bugs. Well, you know. I'm I'm one of those wait and see. I never make any series I'm predictions. I'm hopeful, but yeah, I'm but, hopeful. Um, I, I just look at it as like it's their track record of they've already made a game that's still not finished, and I'm just hoping that like if this game was made by anyone else, I'd be playing it now. But the fact that it's them and that they did some questionable things coming from Ark to Dark and Light and now to this, which some of the stuff was inevitably shown at launch that they still haven't fixed. Well, uh, we've been talking about some of these major titles, but these are definitely not the only major titles that are coming out very soon. So games that are on the horizon, more than a month away, quite a few to talk about, quite a few that people are going to like. Some MMO, some not all very fun. Take a look at this. <laughs>
with that, let's talk about some of these games that we saw. Um, first of all, Wolves Chan, thank you so much for coming on the stream and talking about Atlas. We're going to tap into that resource again as the months go by, and we track that as one of the major games that we're watching develop and progress. So, uh, Star Citizen, uh, Ashes of Creation, Atlas, who else? You know, some other games may show up on that radar. Um, as far as the rest of them go, there's some very nice titles that we just displayed, and we're going to fast hit some of those topics right now. First of all, Division 2. Tell me why you like it, Okies. Tell me what you think. Well, I'm, I'm interested because I did play Division 1 and I had issues with it, but it was still become a fun game that they continuously listened to the, the player base where they iterated on the game. It was a bit late in, in the term of the first game, but they've now realized that by listening to their player base, they can make a better game that we'll all keep playing. Oh yeah, the, I played the, the heck out of Division One. I. I mean, I played I played it for a long time. So everything that come from one point eight onwards will now be base standard in this version of the game. All right, try they, it. They, is, that, is that a game that looks like you might dig into? So it's funny because you know the division constantly gets compared to Destiny, and I actually would definitely play the division. Uh, I may not pick Division Two up immediately. But I will definitely look at it, see how it co how it looks when it first comes out, and I am kind of a sucker for uh, modern day shooters, shooters because I love the guns that are from modern day. I love using the realistic guns in, in different settings, and even though it's not, you know, the combat's not ridiculously realistic, I still I'm still a sucker for that kind of stuff. And this does look like it could be a really fun game. And if they well, polished everything from Division One in this game, then on that note. We, we, the game will be coming out the 15th of March this year. Very so nice, next, very soon. Next, uh, the the story base behind how they used in the first game, there was the issue of bullet sponging. They've actually narratively made a change to that to make it look like there's a reason why some things are more tankier, where they've actually added a like a physical armor to some classes where you have to knock off the armor before you can deal damage to them. So it's not just a number that you have to knock down continuously like in other games. Hmm. So this will feel like the guns have impact, essentially. Yes. Yeah, very nice. All right. Well, that um, sounds way better. First-person shooters, you said, Triad. How about this? Outer Worlds. Outer Worlds is going to give you a first-person experience. Now, it's not an MMO, but it definitely is developed by some interesting uh, crew of people. What do you think about that one, Okies? Yeah, uh, for a player of my own heart. Uh, Obsidian, the company that's making this game was the people who made Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. It's one of the best Fallout games that they made. Uh, they well, were... Fallout 76, did they make that too? No. No. That was all, right. all Bethesda. But this, this game is being made... Um, they have a, a publisher who is hands-off. They want to help, but they don't want to control the game at all. All right. So um, when are we looking at this coming to us on the open market? Um, it's it's slated for Q1, Q2 of this year, but there might be possible delays depending on how much they get done versus where they said they want to make this a premium story. They don't want to rush it out because they want to make it the best story. All right, a little bit a little bit later in the year. So try yeah. is that one you're going to dig into? I, I may very well do that. Um, I haven't. I never got the pleasure of playing through any of Obsidian's previous titles, like New Vegas and some of the other games that they've made. I think they made a couple other fantasy RPGs that I'm not too familiar with myself. But this definitely sounds like something that would be very fun. Um, and another question for you, Okies: Is this game going to be 100% single player, just purely focused yes. on the story? This okay, is great. a 100% RPG based game. And to, to couple onto this story too, that they, I got some information from one of the sources I talked to. The game will be, the choices in the game will be up to you. There, there is uh, early on a mission where you get given a person who speaks to you who wants you to go do a mission to collect medical supplies. Now the, the, the company that that is versing, you can actually hand the, pers the quest giver in to the other team. Hmm. or company and and completely change your story so totally changing the story arc based on your decisions very yes. nice feature um they, they they're saying that they have chosen to have a large world but only small and busy environments to explore right. so sort so, of sort of like a uh, deus ex type feel 
A uh, little bit bigger than that, more more sandboxy feel, well, like a bigger version of Deus Ex, but the, it's the not outer, like that, Fallout is what they say. The Outer Worlds infers that we might travel to other planets as well, right? We we have already, uh, I can tell you, it's two planets, at least four moons, and two to four space stations at nice. launch. All right, everybody who's listening in, The Outer Worlds coming in the next quarter or two, definitely be watching and for that. Just a note before we go on to the next one. There's also been a couple of digs directly at, uh, but they, they have they're actually using a system which is called the tactical time dilation system, which is their version of an aiming system, which was the version that they tried to introduce, but but there's the said no, and it's coming into the game more as a slow mo tactical thing than it is just an auto targeting RNG shooter. Nice. Well, I definitely don't mind them digging at Bethesda with that failed Fallout 76, and I do play Fallout 76. I, it's one of the few survival games that I'm into, and Bethesda's been leaving me uh, a little bit unhappy lately. So uh, I'm intrigued. I am, I am intrigued as well. Now, a game I don't know anything about, but definitely is hitting them. It's going to hit the market. One of you guys can tell me about Days Gone, and here we go. I, I look at it as. A survival zombie apocalypse red dead redemption thing what is it really uh yeah it it, it doubles down on that sort of feel there there's a big story behind it like the character that you're playing as there's there's a lot of narrative behind you know the the concept of that bike that you see in the images that's mm -hmm. his bike it's a specialty bike made that's a it's an off-road pretty much an off-road harley davidson they, they, it's a it's a cross trail between the two. Um, so a the, lot of storyline, a lot of good feature set to it. Uh, is, the is game it is, yes, the game is considered as a dynamic choice game as well, where you can make different choices, and your friend, which is in some of those images there, one of him, and other NPCs will react differently to you during the game if you keep making bad choices or dangerous choices. Oh. Um, the world is fully dynamic, which means uh, that there is a full weather pattern system. There are creatures will react differently at different times of the day. Nice. Um, there are different weapon systems and different ways to go about every mission. All right, so uh, a story-based mission, not or story-based game, not an MMO as well, correct? Yes, this, this awesome. is one of those ones. And when are we expecting this one to? Uh, this soon? one should be the twenty-sixth of April this right. year. I could actually play this while I'm waiting out, waiting for the Outer Worlds. That yeah, this great. is a, just to note, this is a PlayStation 4 game. Ah, well, I'm okay with that. And they're not going to have a PC variant of this? Who's uh, the... No, this was this was a exclusive built one. Who was the company behind this game? Do we know that offhand? We're going to have to dig that one out. We'll have I to dig that one out for sure. Uh, grab that I think in. it was Ben... Bend Studios, if I remember correctly. Okay. Right. So the next two games we're going to talk about here are mobile games. One bad, one good. And the reason why we're going to talk about them really quick is because they were expectant titles. They are expectant titles. One bad, meaning we really shouldn't have seen this come to mobile, and that's the Alien series. Why is that, Triad? Well, so I've actually never really been a huge fan of of the alien series not saying that it's a bad series but you know i have never I've, I've only just kind of like read about the series from kind of like the sidelines because i've never really wanted to just play these games for whatever reason a a but vp alien versus predator undoubtedly a huge title i mean undoubtedly a huge title pc game from oh, from everything I've read, it sounds like they have you know they've had good games. You know they had they've had things like AVP. They had Alien Isolation, which really brought in the, the horror element of Aliens. And then they had some you know some kind of stinkers like uh, Aliens Colonial Marines, which was yep. was super infamous and you know got Gearbox a lot of flack for it. But you know it's it's kind of it kind of stinks that you know this game comes out and this was supposed to be I think it was a it was a sequel or prequel to Alien Isolation. And the fact that it's going to be a mobile-only title, yeah. it goes back to the whole argument. You know, it, it's like, you know, we, we're fans of your series on a specific platform. You know what platform we're on. Why do you then immediately turn around and release and dump on us? Yeah, and, and, and just 
Exactly. And just in, in don't support your fans who supported your game and, you know, su sung its praises on the platform that you released it on initially. But this is a little thing too. I isolation made them millions on millions of dollars. It's not, it wasn't a drop in the bucket. They, they made a huge amount of money from that game. And instead of continuing on with the story with the same player base, they wanted to capitalize on the whole mobile market is more people thinking that you can get more people into the game. This is another decision where it feels like what they did with other games before where they had a really good game and then the next game the publisher itself got involved and they just damaged the game. And then we had to wait for another good version of the game. It sounds like these are a lot of just stories and like we're just seeing a lot of different things where the publisher or a, you know, a, an investor is stepping in and making a decision that they think will be a good decision, but not understanding really the gaming landscape at all. Right. You know, because, yeah. you know, if, if they had released, you know, this next game on PC and just had like a kind of a lower quality mobile port, I'm sure people would have been fine with that, you know, like, and, oh, cool, I can play it on my phone. Could have tied to it, in fact. Things that you did in the mobile affected the things that you did on the PC or yeah. or had a view into the PC version. And like this, a map exactly. This is the this is the problem like I had with the the topic earlier with Blizzard. It's where companies have their investors and their, their publishers set a specific amount of money they want this company or game to make. And that pushes them into a pigeonhole of, well, we need to make this specific game to guarantee this much money. And that's the problem. Yeah, it just steers it in the wrong direction. Now, to do it in a little bit better light, while you're still waiting for your big title to be finished, this next game, and of course this developer, is maybe closer to how we should be doing it right, and that is Blades. Now, Blades is a mobile game. They've said it specifically, it's being the developed and designed for mobile and we've been just talking about how we don't want mobile right we want it to be on a pc well, well blades does not... cross platform you can play it on a pc in fact they're gonna have a mac client pc client ios android etc but why blades right now and what is it holding us off until so with even even with the other issues I have with with Bethesda at the moment with the Fallout franchise, yeah. they handled this very well. This is how game companies should be doing their mobile games. Where this is a filler game, it's a throwback to the older style of game with the older storyline. That is, here's the game until the next version of our game is ready. They're still doing Elder Scrolls Six. It might be years away. Well, hopefully only a year or two. Well, it depends on what they're doing, but <laughs> yeah, how far along even if it's years away, they still have an interim game, but they're not bailing on their franchise. That's the difference where other companies are saying, this is mobile gaming, this is all we're doing now, or this is the only game you're getting. Yeah, And, and that's, and that's where to me. this game is not just on mobile gaming, which was done well, but also even if it was only on mobile gaming, it's only a stepping stone until their other games are available. This was the same to be said with when Fallout 4 came out that they had the the shelter game the the mobile yeah. app micromanaging yeah. game and and it was it was a, a, a tie over if you're bored and you want to play a Fallout game here's a game you want to play Elder Scrolls game here's a game I think and this funny. is how companies should be doing it the, the same thing with Blizzard at BlizzCon that they they could have just put up a splash screen for a new Diablo game that's coming out that's an MMO which has been rumored that they keep backpedaling on now if that was the case people wouldn't be have such an issue uh, but then when further information come out about that company, that the mobile gaming is their only focus, that's where you see their shareholder yeah. plus and they a few other things plummeted. Oh, yes. Yeah. People leave the company. Or you oh, say yeah. Triad. It, I was going to say that I was I was going to kind of agree with Hokies there. It, you know, it was funny to watch, you know, when Bethesda announced Fallout 4 initially, and then they came out with, you know, Fallout Shelter. They announced Fallout Shelter after they had announced Fallout 4. It's like, hey, here's a filler game you can play. I remember seeing all of the positive posts and everything eating up Fallout Shelter as this fun little mini game, you know, just posts on Reddit just for days, just, you know, all the funny things, all the great things about Fallout Shelter. Yeah, and then I you get Fallout 4 and, and play it on that. Yeah. And I mean, that's hey. a year or two after that Shelter but, came out. But, but see, this is the point. Shelter's available on PC. You can play it on your computer. Yep. Or your Switch. And, and, or yeah, or and, your phone. And it's, it's it's heavy with microtransactions if you want to spend them, but it's your choice. But it's only an option. You don't have to play the game. You don't have to spend money. This is not the only game they're making for another five years. 
you know, and that, that's the point with a couple of these companies where it's uh, Alien Isolation and then Blackout. That might be the only game we see for another five years now. And that's from that sad company. because, again, it's a huge title platform. It's almost like saying Star Wars, right? Ugh. Yeah. Um, and then well, take it and make well, on it... that note, there's actually something on that which we can talk about at the end. All righty. We'll, we'll cover that in Q&A. Remember that little piece. Yeah. But, you know, as we're seeing, mobile is becoming a huge trend. Obviously, there's Asian influence to that, a huge market. And I'm not going to suffer any developer for wanting to tap into that market. However, if you can't try to pull it off like Bethesda, where you're putting out a mobile until the PC releases, if you're not trying to do it like um, other quality games are trying to do it, which is to give us both titles, then you're going to miss the bandwagon. You're going to lose player base. And that will also cause you to lose people on your mobile side because there'll be other developers that do it. And those other developers will take us away from your game and take us onto their game, especially if there's any relation between the two. Now, we've been talking about these new games that are coming up, but very specifically, I want to cover three that are coming up in the very short order. And that is Anthem, Metro Exodus, and Far Cry New Dawn. With that, let's take a look, a quick look at Anthem, a highly anticipated title, ups and downs in the industry, lots of people talking about it in multiple directions, one I'm going to definitely keep my eye on. So Anthem looks to be a, it's not really an MMO, right, but it is a multiplayer game? Yes, it's, it's, it's a it's a squadron-based story game that is so considered my, as an MMO. Me and my best friends go on play. play. Yes, closer to the strike system in Destiny, where it's four players in the team doing the mission. But the story itself is your own personal story that that's built in the hub that no one else can access. Nice. But you. So, so what's the gameplay? Is it um, open world it's, path? So it's a, it's it's supposed to be considered as open world, but people are saying it's very linear in path where it's. It's pathways to certain areas that open up into big areas, but then there's another pathway you follow. It's not... It, okay, it's, I mean, that's not that's not a horrible way to go by any means. If there's big areas to explore, I don't mind if I'm getting led through a story yeah. A to B. That's that's fine. I, I don't care for the ones that are strictly... Uh, how can I say? It's like taking a side scroller and making it 3D. You, yeah. know, you jump here, Some, you dodge there, you run from here to there, and you're done with that level, and you did it as yeah, fast as you could. I hate that. There, there, are some, there are some people who have the issue with it was sold as an open world game and it's not like the, the, there's been a a trickle down effect of little changes that people have not liking like uh the vip demo that's supposed to be a demo to show you the game they openly come out the day beforehand saying this game is x amount of weeks b- before they changed everything so this game does not show you what the end game is going to be like hmm. like and and th- that defeats the purpose of the yeah, demo it's bad marketing right there but I understand in- that if the demo was pre-made, but for PC versions, and if they if they if it's just a physical download, which is what people have been doing on the PlayStation, if you can just download it today, that's an update they can fix like in a day. True. But I, I am intrigued by the whole giant armor suit. I can jump yes. around, fly around, hover, shoot things, kind of first-person shooter style. It's not. It's third so, person, right? So it is. It is person with exceptions of certain weapons. A third-person looter shooter game where you are based as a pilot of a mech suit called a Javelin, which is four different individual play styles where you don't pick a class like you do in other games like Destiny. You pick the Javelin to wear, and the Javelin picks what kind of play style you have. Your loadout and your and your Javelins will change what they are. Okay, okay. I can get into that. Well, I mean, that is definitely a hot title a lot of people are talking about. It, when is this due out? So th- this is due out the 22nd of February this year, so not far away. There are there are certain onsides and offsides to it, like people are still having the issue that this is, although it is an amazing Bioware story, it's still essentially published by EA, and they have control of the game. So we which is always a for b- some of their tactics. Yes. Um, the, there's been a couple of things where they're saying that the entire game's story element will be free. So if there's any updates, say in a year down the track, they're doing an update to the 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 patch will be free for story. However, they admitted to tell people that if you don't pay for the DLC or the season pass, you do not access any of that new content when it comes to multiplayer. You have hmm. to buy that to play with your friends. We'll figure. All right. Well, Triad, do you have anything else with this or? Do you want to talk about the next one? No, let's just go ahead and move on to the next one. Right. I, I mean, 
Metro, yeah, this Metro Exodus. Now, this is a title that I'm actually playing the two previous versions, um, 2033 and Light something or other. I, I'm new to it. It's new Last to Light. Last Light. So Metro Exodus is a first-person style shoot uh, Fallout, only Russian, only more creepy, too. Uh, you yeah. do build your weapons. They are very customizable. You are still playing through a story. It is very apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic, as it were. But it looks well done, very different. You know, it's a it's a good spin on that type of title. Um, tell me what you think and why we need to be looking at Exodus as a, a new game coming when? Okies? The 15th of February, so not, that's even February. closer. Even closer. And why is Exodus, or Metro, excuse me, the storyline such a great title? So many people like it. So, So this is based on a novel that was brought out years ago and the whole story is just an evolving story the the player base has affected the game enough with the change in requests that the game has now been but it was originally based in like subway tunnels and, and mine shafts and things like that now it's based on a you, you as the main character join the train which is showing up in some of these slides which is a train that is now above world where you're going to be uh like exploring situations and they pitched it as a linear story however it will be every stop the train makes will be its own survival sandbox gameplay area which can have several hours per area you stop at nice. to play an interesting way to go through it i think where fallout 76 kind of fell down was they didn't really take us through us i mean there was a story to it there is a set of quest line in any case but they're not drawing me through the game to get to a goal, is what I feel. And, I, and I'm and i hearing that Metro looks to do that, draw me through the game with these train stops, as yeah. it were, but still let me explore and look at every nook and cranny and see if I can find yeah. this or that. What, and and the, buzz, the buzzwords for this year were it's it's player choice and dynamic world. That's nice. in almost every game this year. Yeah, and that's, um, that is critical. It's what players have come to desire out of these games is an evolving world or something that they are, are are affecting as it were while they play yeah and and this is another game where the player can choose which way to play the game you can go at night time or during the day which will change what creatures are in the world when you're trying to do the mission hmm. um you can go in with a multitude of different weapons where they have said that there are a crazy amount of modded weapons where each weapon has at least five different individual mods to the weapon very and nice. it can completely change what the weapon does, where you can have a, a baseline shotgun that can turn into a semi-automatic shotgun. Um, <laughs> My style. Yeah. Try there, there's a pistol that can turn into almost like a minigun. Nice. Try it, are you going to be playing uh, Metro with me, Exodus? I definitely need to pick up the first two games, because from everything that I've heard, there were developers that worked on uh, Half-Life and Half-Life 2 that had moved over to this company and helped develop the Metro games, so that yeah. apparently these have a very big Half-Life feel. And since we're not going to get Half-Life 3 anytime soon, <laughs> this can supposedly very well fill in that hole that was and left we, by... And we know yeah, there's a huge too. community around the Half-Life series. So if this helps feed that need over there... I and you, go ahead. you do feel that from Last Light onwards because they come in the development, late in the development cycle of 2033 into Last Light. And you can see where they affected the change in the game and how the play style is not as much Half-Life, but you can see the little things they took from Half-Life and put it into this game. Very nice. That's Metro Exodus. There yes. are two first parts to it. If you haven't played it, like Triad or myself, I encourage you to go grab that pack. Steam, 30 bucks for two yes. games. And not bad at all. And a note from the developer, they said that it, there is a current issue with the latest PhysX updates. Um, if there is an issue, stand by because they are trying to fix the update problem with the older games. Hey, every every game comes with a bug. As long as they're actively fixing it, doesn't bother me at all. It, it's it's just the old game, new hardware issue they're trying to fix. Nice. So that brings us to the Far Cry series. Undoubtedly, again, a huge title, followed by millions. Very fun games, right up to and including version 5, if, I, if I'm correct? Or four, yes. 5. 5. But now we have Far Cry New Dawn. And Far Cry New Dawn, the first thing that grabbed me out of it was the colorization. Yeah, they have the... opted to put 
colors unlike most games. Now, Outer Worlds also does this. Another reason why I'm attracted to that game, too, is, is the bright features and color sets, etc. But Far Cry New Dawn certainly gets a AAA award for how much color and how much... If you want to call it pretty or bright or brilliant, it's there. Now, why is Far Cry New Dawn different? Okay, so so in, in this version of the game, if you thought the last game, Fallout 5, was great, this game is crazy okay. on crazy on acid. Sorry, okay. fuck right. Yeah. Sorry. Crazy um, on acid. Huh. Uh, the the game elements show you with uh, with the the color palette that they're going for a bright dystopian style game that follows very shortly after the first game, which without spoiling it, um, leads on to the events that happen in this game. And they've completely changed the elements in this game where the, the bright colors you see are not just in the environment of the players made. It's also shown in the creatures in the world as well. Oh, yeah. And there is the third clue for everybody who is watching and wants to get on the giveaway coming up very shortly here. The third clue is there. You need to go into the Discord. You need to go get yourself assigned a role. J-A-N-G-V-W. Just wanted to note that for those people who are listening live. You have a chance to win any one of our three prizes just by simply adding adding a role to your account. And then during the giveaway section, we'll draw on those users and see who wins what. Um, with that, we have covered all of our best games, the things that we're really interested in. We're certainly going to want to hear from you know the community out there as a whole, things they might want to hear about in February. We'll go get some research done for you. Now, we're not in this show just about games. We also talk about tech, and there's a couple pieces of tech I want us to get into. These pieces of tech are impressive, to say the least. Right out of the gate, we always look for it. We want to be mobile. We want to have the horsepower of our desktop. Well, I'm going to say it, Alienware. Dude, you should have bought an Alienware. And no, I'm not going to tell you to go buy an Alienware. Still got to give them kudos for what they did so here, let me though. put it this way. This is tech the talk. Alienware tech Area 51M. And in the words of our Alienware rep, which if he wasn't such a nice guy, who's very credible, I would find very hard to believe. Yes, Linus, it has a full Core i9 9900K processor in it. And I went, really? Because everything that I know about size and heat and how much you need to get rid of how much of it a 9900K would produce would indicate that that sort of thing would be basically impossible. And that's even ignoring the rest of the completely over-the-top specs of this thing. So it can be equipped with up to a, an RTX 2080 Ti graphics card with six gigs of GDDR6 memory. That's GDDR6, right? Yes. It's got, what, I'm assuming dual NVMe boot drives in RAID 0. Do you have a two and a half inch expansion drive in here? Surely not. There's two and a half inch drive in here? Uh, okay. It's, it's got a 1080p, 144 hertz panel, which might not be that impressive today, but it's thin bezel and there's a plan for later this year to upgrade it to 240 hertz. And they've done all of this within, like, I would say a fairly slim desktop replacement form factor. That's right. Now, I wouldn't say too slim. I mean, that's kind of bulky in the back there. However, as a laptop that's got that much, much monster horsepower, the first thing you can say is price. Price, 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 price. Plus, it's an alien where so just tack on a few more dollars there. But check it out. We are starting to see mobile equipment that has really high-end high end, uh, parts in it, like an i9900, uh, 2080 Ti card, etc. Alienware M51 laptop. Might want to go sneak a peek if you're in the market for one. Also, oh. that that will be slimmer probably coming in the next like six months to a year anyway. Yeah, as they develop it out and not use reference parts. Might agree. Now, moving on, we're just going to step right through some of these things here. Another piece of cool and interesting tech is Hudway. Hudway is a heads-up system for your car. Now, there are plenty of products out there that are heads-up systems for your cars. There's even cars with them built in. But this is the first time, and I've, and I've done a lot of research on this, this is the first time when you get one that's usable in the daytime. Now, that's a big deal because heads-up displays usually reflect off of your, your front windshield, your front windscreen, however you like to say that. But they, they just blur out in the daytime. You just can't see them. So they've developed this little mini projector that puts that up there. And what's also cool is it just runs off of your iOS or Android phone. So just about any app you've got can be pretty much put up there. 
So it's nice to be able to see who the call is coming from or be able to see what your speedometer is or, you know, maybe some of your sensor information from your car. And certainly what everybody loves is a navigation that points in front of you and gives you the directions rather than you trying to look down at your nav panel or your phone or letting it talk to you the whole time. You're out listening to music. Now you can have a heads up display. The price is actually very reasonable. It is $300, but there is no other tech that's competing in the market right now. Hudway, check it out. It even projects like out over your head, uh, hood at a distance so it doesn't feel like you're really looking at your, you know, you're changing your focus to your uh, the windshield. You're just still focusing out there where you're driving out in front of you. So very cool and interesting tech. Definitely suggest for you guys to take a look at it. This, um, this is also coming out for which is good it's coming out with everything you need in one package when you buy it the 300 dollars covers a huge like group of things that you need most other companies will sell you the part and then all the other extras you have to pay for separately and that this, is this a, company is that's a huge bonus because you're saving probably 100 or two in that process right there and it's on most older cars that don't have the option of the heads up display which is the biggest thing right okay so moving on we're going to talk about epic now Yes, this is a game thing, but we're going to talk about it as in technology. Why is that, Triad? So, the interesting thing with Epic now is, as many people have been aware, that they are starting to create their own store, their own storefront. And the big draw with this new storefront is they're actually giving a larger cut to developers. And in some cases, if you're using the Unreal Engine 4 to develop your game they're waiving the cost of publishing and producing with the Unreal Engine 4 if you publish it on their store. So, so now... Why, why as a developer would I care? I mean, there's Steam. It undoubtedly owns this universe. And Steam has definitely got people that will buy my game and the marketing for it. I mean, Steam, it's enough said. Why Epic now? So aside from the obvious bigger chunk of change that you're getting from publishing your game on the Epic Game Store, there's a... Not as, I mean, maybe it's widely realized, but a little unknown and realized market that people seem to kind of forget about is that Epic Games has their, their really big game right now, Fortnite. Mm -hmm. And Fortnite is, you know, this massive juggernaut of a, you know, of a, of a MOBA, or a, not a MOBA, a uh, Battle Royale game. It, you know, PUBG came out, took the world by storm, and then Epic Games was like, hey, we can do that better. And they did. It has millions upon millions of people that play this game. But one of the biggest player bases of this game is actually kids. Mm -hmm. And and children, you know, playing this game, you know, because are, are seeing this and they're they're able to play it on their 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 consoles, their PCs, their phones. They're able to get access to this game from any device. And then not only that, they're all of their friends are playing this game. You know, you're going to school. What's what's the cool new game to play? Oh, it's Fortnite. So all of their friends are coming in playing Fortnite. So you now so have got a baked in user base of millions, and then you turn around and you release your own game store, and you can say to me, the developer, so I'm just an indie developer and I'm making my new little RPG or whatever it is, I should publish with you because I know I have a current huge baked in millions of players to advertise to, and I'm gonna get better royalties. So I'm gonna make more money still get a huge penetration in the marketplace because there's just millions and millions of players out there that I can be advertised to. And you're giving yeah. it a true alternative to Steam now, then. Yes. Also, yeah. as a point to the market, this is exactly what Steam did when they brought out CSGO. This was a, a requirement you had to install was Steam to play CSGO. And that's how they got their player marketed in the first place because our generation, that was the game to play. This generation, it's Fortnite. And with that, they're, they're bringing in uh, a bigger audience that, that is the new generation that doesn't hold a library in Steam that has hundreds of games or thousands of games like some of us have. They might not even have a Steam account or the Steam account maybe has 10 games in it. So they're more prone to move to Epic and stay on the Epic library. So they're, they're cutting off the new blood supply that's going to Steam. So rather than have the next generation of kids come in and, oh, my favorite game's on Steam, well, we'll just get it on Steam. No, they're going straight to the Epic Game Store, getting their games there because all the new big games are coming out of the Epic Game Store. And they're already before you know it because of their Fortnite session. So it's before you know it, there. yeah, and before you know it, they have the same thing that we currently have on our Steam Game Store 
where we have all of our games in Steam, they'll have all their games in Epic Games, and why would they switch to Steam? Nice. Yeah. All right. And so, so this is why we bring this into the tech news because the technology here is a launcher and a store. Now, granted, there's a game that really backs this Fortnite, and it is a game company, Epic. We understand that. However, the technology here is what's going to benefit us as a player base. We're going to get better prices. We're going to see games. We're going to see a competitor to Steam to maybe sharpen their stick a little bit. Maybe, maybe get them doing some better stuff for us as well. Uh, maybe half life three. The market. Which for this year, I would say wait to see what Steam sales are going to be like this year because they're going to have to do something to win back the player base, which means we will win in the long run. They might even look at reducing their player, um, player to developer cost which is the cost difference that they have currently where steam is 30 percent now as far as we know e epic said it's 12 percent is all they take but that drops even lower if you're someone who already pays the five percent to uh, epic for the the engine as well because in essence if you pay the 30 percent to steam you still have to pay epic the five percent you've made yeah. For so, using their engine as a developer i'm looking at that's a huge delta in money i mean well not, not just that they're, they're saying that uh what's happened is and this is the echo chamber that keeps happening is with a digital game they have to increase the price again like they did with physical copies to offset that share that they don't get by reducing the price that also means they can bring down the overhead cost which means a 50 dollars game could be a 40 dollars game in a year that would release as a forty dollar game because they don't have to cover that extra thirty percent they're giving Steam. Nice. Well, watch for that. Epic coming out with its own game uh, distribution system, a huge player base, and better prices. We might be able to get our games at a better price as players. Now, uh, moving on through technology, one of the big things that came out, I guess, maybe is in response to AMD. Who knows? Nvidia and G Sync, and they're letting go of the reins a little bit. But are they? Let's talk about that a little bit. So the G-Sync certified system that's coming in place of uh, the free sync monitors that are currently there, which will allow NVIDIA to take the market and say, we can put our product on the free sync market as well and show you it, but we're going to set a specific amount of terms and conditions. Now, there are a couple of issues with this that we have, and a lot of people are starting to pick up on it now. Um, people are worried that there is a cost involved that is going to be transferred to us, the player, where before you would buy an AMD card and a FreeSync monitor and say the combined cost is cheaper because the FreeSync monitor is $200 cheaper, the graphics card is $300 cheaper. But now they're saying that they want their... NVIDIA are trying to get these partnerships to increase their price to match the G-Sync monitors which in turn is going to be a trickle-down effect where only the the, uh, the base monitors will be FreeSync. Hmm. They want to remove the label of FreeSync from these monitors once they become G-Sync certified. So what is AMD's counter? I mean, because they're obviously uh, FreeSync. Currently, they're looking at making it so that any FreeSync monitor they have is fully adaptive. Um, they're saying that they are going to try and talk to the AOB OEM partners and keep that price down as much as they can. Nice. And then as consumers, should we care? Does it matter as a technology? Do we go for AMD? Um, What's so, so, so the issue, the issue here, which I, I got a couple of notes here was because they're, they're developing into four separate versions of monitors in the market. The higher base monitors, which were the premium FreeSync monitors, are now going to be premium G-Sync certified monitors. Now, that means that if you're someone who went, hey, that's a $300 monitor, that's really cool, it has everything I want. No, that's now a $600 monitor just because it has that sticker on it. Oof. And, and, and this is the problem where we're going to have to hang up the cost as the consumer because... You know, Asus was one of the ones they said, and Acer, who have already signed on. They were the first ones who were part of CES to say we're partnered in this. We're going to see over the next year that the, the, the trickle down into the retail space, they're just going to keep tacking on more and more of that price to, to make up the difference. Huh, okay. And, well, and, what, go ahead. Uh, and, and it's just, it feels like the, the comment that was made to us as well was the lack of anything NVIDIA is doing right now that's going to compete with what's coming from AMD. This is just their way to try and overshadow AMD the best they can. Hmm. Well, 
information like that actually makes me a little bit hangry. What I mean by that is hungry and angry. Why am I hungry? Because of the time of day. Why am I angry? Because I don't like it when a developer opts to force me to buy a very expensive solution to enjoy a technology that kind of should come out there and be more available. Might be a reason for me to look again toward AMD. But to solve that other problem with the hungry, let's talk about a product, technology, something new. At least it's new to me. It's called Impossible Burger. Now, Impossible Burger sounds impossible, but here's the deal. Tell me about it, Okies. Okay, so it's a company that's been around for a while who have been developing a burger, but the it's not what you would... Uh, they've been at CES and a couple of other places multiple times now, giving out these burgers for people to try. Many okay. people love them, and they can't believe that the industry as a standard is starting to adopt them. The big selling point that people don't realize is with these burgers is they do not have meat in them, even okay, though well, you well, see well, meat in the pictures. Now. Hold on. I'm looking at meat. I mean, anybody who's watching this is going to see meat. And I have tried veggie burgers. My wife likes these things. I can't stand them. And you know what they look like. It's like, uh, you know, a blended soup of vegetables that's then made into a patty. And then you try to microwave or fry it or whatever. But it's just not the same, right? It's, it's healthy. No. But so it's, this it's not meat. <laughs> this is a plant-grown substitute, which then comes to the texture of meat during the process they make. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, so so everybody's had tofu. Tofu's a plant. Is this tofu? Uh, no, th this is this is something that was developed that actually is supposed to have the texture and taste of meat. Um, all right, all right. You said texture and taste. I grab the meat. I make the patty. I put whatever little special ingredients to make my barbecue flavor, whatever my super secret chili sauce is, and then I go and put it on the barbecue. And I give it a great sear because, you know, that brings out a type of texture and a flavor. Am I going to get that with this? Yes. So I can enjoy a healthy burger but still have my sear or my grease or my whatever you want to call it, meat, but without maybe all the cholesterol. Yes. They're, they're looking at adding in a couple of extra ingredients over the next year or so during testing. Although, don't get me wrong. Me saying that, this is actually a live product you can go buy now. If you look it up on many stores, they actually have, if you look up Impossible Foods, the product is like nationwide in America already oh, yeah. and I've, branching I've out to other lots countries. lots of restaurants where I can go get it. I tried to find a grocery store, yeah. reluctantly as, couldn't. As you can see in the image there, as of CES, they announced that White Castle is going to now co-sign to sell the burger as a product in their store. And that's a huge jump for anybody's product because that is a huge chain. And, and, it's well and the, 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 the point of this was not just um, the, the fact that it's not a meat product. You know, this is not a, you know, a, a vegan or a vegetarian fighting to say we don't want meat. This is actually a return to a problem that's happened, which is it's a cost versus agriculture that's happened at the moment. Uh, currently, um, I, th I think they say that's two thirds of the world's land mass is used for doing this kind of farming for animals. Huh. And this will, this by doing this, that. yeah, by doing this, they actually cut that down to zero in terms of how much space they need for grazing and turn them into land-based farms that any kind of farmer around the world can do as a crop. Well, they can, they can build this and sell it. Now, and that means that it uses half the land and consumes only a quarter of the fresh water that would normally be required for those animals. Th those are excellent stats. I know it's not going to replace the amino acids and certain no. vitamins in actual red meat, but I'm not eating beef five days a, uh, a week uh, or seven days a week. I would suggest most people don't. But you do have to consume some, in my opinion, and I do. Yes. I would just like to have a burger every day without the consequence of having a burger every day. And this sounds yes. like, Meh, and there you go. And this this was a point that they were pushing, that it has, it has a lot of nutrients and things that they can add, that they're still adding to it to try and make it a healthy burger that's still good for them. It's not going to replace red meat, but what they're saying is if you only need red meat twice a week... You can have this burger three or four times a week, and it's not going to affect that, that offset. Nice. You're not going to now, say, oh, I've had the burger, now I need this. Now they need to release uh, chicken breast and uh, bacon, and I think uh, <laughs> it's going to be a full convert to Impossible Well, we're, we're waiting to see what flavor options are going to be like. <laughs> let's but let's the, be honest, the, nothing's ever going to replace bacon. <laughs> true, true. But, not even... but in, the context, in the context of this, you can have bacon on this. 
They're not, they're not stopping you from doing those things. What they're saying is it's not a substitute for meat. It's a substitute for cost and effectiveness too. Well, so and, these burgers will benefits. eventually be... Well, not just health benefits though. This is what they're saying, that when it comes to a big company like White Castle... So this is going to be cheaper to produce because it's like growing wheat. It's going to be something that you, you farm, you pay a farmer to, to do this X amount of times. They put it to a process and then it's to your store. They, they're cutting out four or five processes normally that are involved with the meat part of it, mm -hmm. which then in turn will make the cost less, which means that some of these burgers where you could see a dollar burger or a 50 cent, they're talking these burgers can be a quarter of that price eventually. Well, then that has even further reaching possibilities like uh, third world countries where we can start getting yes. some healthy foods into third world countries and without some of huge these... expenses that can, can happen. In, and they might even be able to make it themselves locally made, which it, some is of a these, great thing too. Some of these things are not hard to do. All they need is a, a specific way that they process it to be implemented into that. They have huge, like Africa was one of the ones brought up during the press conference, which was... They have acres on acres of land that they could make this into a thing that they could produce for people, which is cheaper and more cost effective than trying to produce animals, which then cost them their own money that they use to live off to produce meat to sell right. to try and make back living costs. Right. And you know, now that I'm getting all hungry for an Impossible Burger, I'm, when I did my search, my town, which is really a, a metro area of a bigger city, didn't actually have any places that had it. Now, I'm sure they're going to expand into the area, but not far away, four or five miles, is a dozen, two dozen, three dozen. I mean, there were so many. I could travel all over the metro area and find them, just not for some reason over in my neck of the woods. Now, how I would get there, or at least maybe soon, is via a Bell drone. That's right. Bell Helicopters is making a drone that I would use to go get my future Impossible Burger. Now, why would I want to do that? Tell me all about this. Okies. So, it's not, <laughs> I was just bringing up the, the uh, tech notes. thing I've got in front of me. So, um, Bell, Bell Aviation has been working on decades and decades of experience on these kind of helicopters. They've made helicopters for years and years. They're looking to develop a helicopter that's more agile, easier for the user, and as you can see from the images, um, it looks like a behemoth, but it actually works better and has more functionality than a basic helicopter, which and, will then in turn be cheaper to let run. Me, let me add, you guys, you're looking at some obviously art pictures. One of the, th the shots is actually at CES where this drone really does exist. It oh, and it functions. And functions. It, wasn't, it wasn't a concept. It functions. It could fly. So drone technology is cool because of the multiple or redundancy in its... Uh, lift system, whereas a helicopter typically has just the one uh, propeller taking you up in the air, or maybe some some of them have two. If the system dies, well, you know, it's pretty much a rock. It falls to the ground and you're done. In a drone system, and if anybody's ever messed with a you know a little personal drone, you have several uh, lifting devices. So if one goes down, the rest are still keeping you in the air and taking you down safely because you have a down propeller. Odds yeah. of losing two are pretty extreme. So it actually becomes a safer form of flight. Also, it's more cost effective. As you can see in one of the images and, and the flat image, they, they are not a completely horizontal to vertical. They actually shift so that liftoff is easy, then it can be shifted into the flight mode, which would then in turn save more power versus a normal helicopter. Yeah. They're talking a faster. quarter of a quarter of the fuel being used at a faster speed. Nice, and that's and, that's a critically important thing and, because helicopters have a top speed, and if I'm trying to get to Vegas, well, you know, those of us who want to get to this, Vegas really quick, then this is also a hybrid momentum is important. Just as a reference, this is a hybrid system that uses electricity and fuel nice you know gotta as be, well which gotta be eco friendly that's, that's good but that that version that they've now updated to would reduce the cost even more and i also noticed that they put displays like in the ceiling so you have entertainment you know they've, they've used all of the latest technology obviously as we would expect any new product to have so yeah, that's... stock market a few other things they come uh, with a list of information with um it is a four seater plus pilot that comes with autopilot and semi automated flying on the flight deck nice the the system can be considered as uh when it's finally implemented as the you know, uber of the skies um it also comes with if you're the person in getting picked up 
the availability for the use of voice calls, Wi-Fi, and artificial intelligence to look up and do um, like research for you inside the cockpit, as well as wireless phone charging that is inbuilt into every rubber armrest seat. Nice. Whoa. Whoa. Now, did you just say Uber of the sky? Yeah. So, this... are you... Are you well, saying... Well, so here you go, Triad. We know that you and I don't live really that far apart by terms of flight, meaning if we're going to fly it, it's only going to be a couple hours. If we're going to drive it, eh, lots and lots of hours. The distance between our cities isn't that great by air. But then I have to go down to my local, you know, giant airport. I have to go through the check-in process. I have to wait for boarding. Then take the flight that's only a couple hours. Then I have to do the offboarding. I have to get my piece of luggage. And I have to go over to wherever you're at. There's one major airport here. There's one for you, or maybe two, because you're in a bigger city. But there's hundreds of small airports. Maybe some that are right around the corner from your place. So if I could just call up an Uber like this, and I'm going from one major destination to the next, which is common anyhow, why not me and you know three other people and a pilot jump into this little Uber, get me over to your place. Maybe they'll continue on, on from there, but I've taken my portion of the ride. And I'm not waiting this long, inordinate time. You know, it's it's like doing an Uber versus waiting at a bus stop forever for the next bus to come by, or a train, which is even longer, or even a plane. So, yeah. Uber to you, nice. Boba. And, and Bell have even imp implemented a safety system which allows them, if they need to, to remote access the helicopter if there is an incident where the pilot cannot fly. Huh. Very nice. So, so they can essentially fly it like a drone. It's going to be fitted with a system that allows it to detect and avoid anyone else so that even if it is a seasoned pilot and someone who's not seasoned gets in the way, the system will avert disaster. It's, it's, that's what the AI is built hey, into it. For. You know, they're, they're building that into the car, auto car driving stuff, so it makes sense that yes. it be built into this. Now, to move into our next little topic here, in the top of this Bell helicopter is a giant display. And it fits to the ceiling. And then there's displays at the front for the cockpit. And this new technology, while we're all very used to you know, LCD technology and LED technology, and now OLED technology, one of the newest, hottest things coming to the market, and I want to really point this out, is the Samsung wall, or micro LED technology. It is almost impossible to explain the functionality of everything this can do. So we have Jerry Riggs Everything, who has done a great job at tracking this at CES. It'll be our last topic for today before we move into qual uh, quality, or sorry, into Q&A, questions and answers, and a giveaway. So take a look at this, the hottest new display technology coming. <laughs> Huge thanks to Samsung for sponsoring this video. So you might be thinking to yourself, all TVs are the same, but that's not quite the case. Samsung has just released a modular micro LED TV that's pretty incredible. I'm gonna show you how it works. Let's get started. So here's the thing with the new Samsung micro LED TVs. They're completely modular and customizable. Size free, ratio free, bezel free, and resolution free. You can combine these little squares together to make a TV as big or small as you want. You can see the TV behind me, it's a one by eight panel that's completely modular. Each of the little squares can disconnect and be put somewhere else. Let's say you have a TV budget for this year. You can buy the panels, get a TV as big as your budget allows, and then next year, if you have a larger budget, you can buy more panels to make your TV even bigger and increase the resolution. Anywhere from 4K, 6.5K, 10K, as big as you want, as much resolution as you want. It's pretty interesting. Plus, with the modularity of this TV, you know repairability is pretty important for me and my channel. If one panel happens to break, let's say you're getting aggressive during a video game and someone throws a controller at the screen and cracks it. You've seen the YouTube videos where people do that. Instead of replacing the whole TV, you can just replace the one particular panel. So I think this technology definitely has a place in the world and I'm excited to see where it's going. So how does it work? Magnets. Each of these modular squares has a back plate, which mounts directly into the wall. There's kind of like a master square that controls all the squares around it. And each of the rear panels have two little latches that pop up. There's little metal contact pads, and they clip into the panel next to it, just like a little connector. 
to get their information and signal from that master square in the center. And because each of these little modular panels have no bezels, you can stick them right next to each other and the seam disappears when the content is displaying. Now this isn't on the market just yet, it's just where the future's headed. I think modular micro LED TVs are the way of the future. And the same technology that they're using in these modular blocks is used in Samsung's massive TV, which I'll show you right now. Viewing angle on this thing is insane. Even when you're like right up close to it, you still can't see the pixels inside of it. And you can still see the whole image. This is crazy. It can be a window to the outside world. It can watch your movies. And the internal technology, the artificial intelligence, displays whatever content scaled to the right dimensions for your uniquely sized modular TV. So with 8K TVs, obviously not everything is 8K content just yet. We're barely getting into the 4K realm. But with Samsung's TV that they're calling the wall because of how big it is, it has internal AI that can upscale high definition, ultra high definition, 4K. It upscales it to 8K so it looks even better in real life. So this massive TV behind me is still the same modular technology that we saw in the smaller TVs over there. This is what Samsung's calling the wall TV because it can literally take up an entire wall. So LED TVs are 100% light efficient. All of the light emitted from the LED shoots directly out to your eyeball, the viewer. Plus the micro LEDs use inorganic material, which means there is no burn in with this new technology. So you can have the same outside of your window displaying for years with no burn in on this TV. Samsung does have their high resolution 8K QLED technology up and running. Uh, it's not modular, but it's still 8K, super light. impressive. I'll leave the current pricing it. down in the description if you're curious. So whether you're the type of person who likes to go out and buy the latest stuff, or you just like knowing what's out there for the future. With that, I'll let the video play, but the concept of the micro LED modular uh, aspect ratio, it doesn't care. The shape. It doesn't care. Make a square, make an L, make an H, make an X. I mean, do what you want to, connect them how you want to, and you have this incredible capability to deliver what looks like a brilliant picture. And as he said, if a piece of it goes bad, it's only a piece. When you need to move it, you could disassemble it into just a bunch of um, individual squares. And those individual squares can then be put into a box and you're not like, get me a buddy and we got to carry out this monster thing and does it fit in my rig you just softly pack them into a box you got a whole stack of them right there in the box you take it to the next place put it up remodular put them together the way you want and away you go in fact there's another technology in this that is how can they say it's a power off mode but obviously it isn't and that is you can set it to an image let's say it's a picture of outside through a window and then in essence power it off but it'll continue to just display that image without really using any power. So a very low voltage standby, for lack of a better term. So you could literally have this as a window looking outside, and then when you want, turn on the TV. And in fact, because it's so modular, just turn on four of the corner panels and watch something while the rest of the display is showing outside. Each panel can show its own source or be part of the bigger whole. The technology is just baffling, and it has huge far-reaching thoughts like instead of three monitors on my desk I would just have four of these panels crossed same height one foot tall but now four feet wide and I can always take one down and use it for another PC tell me what you guys are thinking about this I mean this is just incredible right so I think this technology is kind of ridiculous because this lets you create like you were saying, like like Haley was saying in the video, this is what you're gonna let you create a wall of screens in any configuration, any dimension that you want. This has far-reaching, uh, kind of far-reaching notions in the industry that I currently work for, which is the digital signage industry. So digital signage is more or less just you know getting getting content such as you know live data, videos, images, whatever it may be up onto screens and in front of people so that they can view it. That also includes interactive screens so that you can touch and map your way to different things from a little kiosk that you can find like in a mall or an airport or something like that. Something like this could let companies, you know, not only create huge walls of screens that we could then work with and, you know, put bigger and bigger content on, but this can let them do all sorts of crazy configurations so they can create, you know, maybe they have like a really nice art deco piece or something like that, or a really nice, 
you know, like uh, waterfall or, or something like that. They can put these screens around that in those weird nooks and crannies and just into every space that they can so that they can get, you know, the content that they want to put up that they need to put up, you know, for that information, that messaging, whatever oh, it is. Oh, yeah. Store all over the place. Display capability, whether it's a restaurant or Tiffany's jewelry. The fact that you don't have to buy your standard 16 by 9, 4 by 3, whatever size monitor or screen, the fact that you can make them into the shapes you want. So think about it. You could have it going down each side of your big window of uh, jewelry across the bottom as well. Down each side, you're showing images of the jewelry. Across the bottom, it's details, you know, their website, phone numbers, prices, who knows, whatever, catalog stuff. Because you can individually display per uh, little square what you want for content or merge them or, you know, wh whatever type of demo you build. It just becomes a huge advertising piece for these, even just this weird market. You oh, know? yeah. Uh, the fact that I can snatch a cube off the wall go to another room and put it onto that mount over there and now i've increased its size without actually buying more is phenomenal so that's even just my own consumption let alone the commercial viability of this and what it could do so no, the commercial viability of this is insane yeah it's just yeah. insane so sam so during go ahead go during ahead. the investment uh and the show for those who were involved in early feedback they actually had a room that was just these lining in the wall. And people didn't know what they were. They just looked like lines on the wall because they were embedded in the wall. They were, they were color matched to be the exact same color as the wall itself to start with. <laughs> and then when they played the intro to what they were talking about, they had the anchor piece on the wall, which is just the black square that you see. It, the, the anchor piece is what they're calling the, 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 the one you have to buy with the control yeah, pretty the much. the first piece, the brain. So that's the only one that you need to control the TV. Everything else is just modular on top of that. You purchase separately. They had that on the wall, and then they had a heart beast that was pulsing, and it was running along the walls to that anchor. Hmm. And like that, that was a, an amazing promo to show you how that they could use these in, in like a commercial sense. These can be on the floor if they have something protecting them. And they yeah. can pr pretty much be a display on the floor that can be the entire length of the room. Um, it, the the fact, fact that it, it says could be, it could be a line of them, the length of the room, directing you along yeah. to different things. Well, that's what they're saying. <laughs> um, it, it can be a pathway for people who need to be shown where to go and things like that. Um, and, it can also update all the time. And they're not real thick, screen. so it's not like it's a huge mounting effort. I mean, the things are only like yeah. an inch and a half thick, so they're thinner than most monitors you could get now. Yeah, and and this is this is the thing that I thought was amazing is that it has an AI smart adaptive system built into the anchor. So as soon as you put in a certain amount of modules, it will automatically configure to that size. Yeah, its aspect ratio less capability is mm -hmm. phenomenal. Behind him, the waterfall scene is actually a much larger display, but the technology knew to display basically what would be the center part of that yeah. in that long vertical display. Now you see it breaking apart, and it's become two different displays in that particular clip. Yes. It, it's just... You know, go kudos on you, Samsung. That's all I gotta say is kudos on you. It's yeah. way to go. If I remember correctly, the top and bottom ones are the anchors. Mm -hmm. So, so but that's all they, they need with the anchors. Yeah, when they join, they move the panel, I should say, to join yeah. the other anchor. It just becomes a part of what that one's displaying. Well, the 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 system they're working on, which they might have updated since we saw it. So don't get me wrong, this might be completely different. But individual ones like the one he's holding could be considered the anchor now. That's what they were trying to originally do. So there was no difference between them. Nice. So that way they could just mass produce one item and then sell it. And the only difference is I think it's got a mounting point on the back that you don't get to see in, in the images. That mounting point is the bit that they have, like you buy separately to mount the, the first one to anchor it to the wall. Yep. But other than that, it, it's set in place. The no burn-in is the thing that they're talking about when they say, with micro LED, there is no burn-in, which means that you can have a wallpaper display that is on low wattage, like I'm talking, don't even know what's on milliwatts. Yeah, like s silly, like to the point where they said that you can actually have these displaying artwork in your house, yep. and people wouldn't know the difference, and you wouldn't know the difference because your power draw would be almost nothing. Yep, and that's awesome because again, think about replacing your window. You've got a camera on the outside, so your wall is now displaying what you'd see through the window, anyways. But yep. at a moment's notice, and flick, you're watching a movie, and. <laughs> And, and they said that you can actually do picture-in-picture. Picture. You can do multiple images at once. 
Right. The, the idea that you they showed us the the original video image they showed some of us who were gave them feedback. The whole wall was a panel, but they never told anyone. So what they did was sneakily they had a wall display image of the wall itself there with curtains and everything. <laughs> and you saw the image, which was only a small one, and then it got bigger and everyone freaked out. But then it got even bigger and then bigger and they just kept adding the panels to the display as they were doing it where they were already on the screen, like on the wall, uh -huh. but they just activated them. And so it looked like the screen was just growing on its own. It, it's it's phenomenal technology. Just yeah. phenomenal. And these things actually can be used at the size of theaters, is what they're saying. Yep, 200. Currently so, on their website, I saw a 219-inch version but of course with the modular technology yeah. you can just keep going they're saying they're saying that they're hoping to get to like literally you could have uh, no projector no 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 current display system you would have normally in a even in the cinema yep would just be these if they could have it set up big enough in it, the ratio it would be so so much more brilliant of a picture too because it's not projector yeah. well and they're saying if if they can um get the cost down for the anchor to be the same price so that they're all the same um the cost of these will be insanely cheap which means that if you can only afford to have four a year or you can only afford to buy five in total and then you know you get a pay rise you can buy more and you can slowly incrementally buy these which means it'll be a standard tv in most houses to start with and then people can just get to the bigger and bigger tvs as they get more money yep very nice well that's going to wrap on our tech news. We're going to move into our question and answer and giveaway uh, point now. Um, so Q and A, um, we're going to watch inside of the Steam chat. We're going to watch at the tavern itself for anybody who might have some questions on any of these topics that we've covered, or maybe suggest some topics that we might want to cover next time. I'll go ahead and get prepared to get the bot online so we can do a giveaway here for anybody that's uh, taking the time to, you know, set it all up and get it done. Um, so questions? Triad, I think you had a question about that technology too. So you, you got a question too? Which piece? Oh, that wall. Um, no, I think all my questions pretty much got answered. I think everybody covered it pretty, pretty thoroughly, but it definitely does look like a really interesting piece of technology and having that panel, that, that modular panel like that will definitely... At least, and I know in the digital science world, that's going to make that's going to be making waves. And I I could see within the next year or two, um, you know, those types of walls up in different companies to actually, you know, be a very big, uh, a very big component and piece for like video walls and yeah. requirement for video walls. Well, what's amazing too with this is that every modular piece is the piece you can replace if there's damage to. You don't have to replace them all; just the one that's damaged, as J Jerry spoke about. And that's and that's going to be a huge piece of it. Now, do we think we'll start seeing technologies like this show up in a car, like a Tesla, or maybe in that Bell helicopter, things like that? Mm, maybe not initially, but I could definitely see in the next five years. Sure. Well, you think about it: if they make micro panels, so that, say the panel a quarter of the size it is, that they can be placed anywhere inside a car. Then you can custom shape them to whatever size you want. Very nice. So it does look like we have a question from React on Live. He asks, when is the next talk going to happen? So we're looking at February 23rd at noon. Now, it's going to be much shorter than this one. I apologize for the length of this one. We were covering so many topics, and it's our first run around on this. So, you know, we're, we're, we're still learning it. We're still learning it. But, yes, February 23rd, noon again, because it seems to work out best for my hosts yep. and all my viewers. And it, it to, as a reference, that's the last Sunday of every month for us here and Saturday for you guys. Yep. If you quickly. And we're going to try to keep it on Saturdays and toward the end of the month so we can cover the tech news that has come out during the month. You know, these games are going to update us during the month. We're going to do some digging for you. We're going to pull out that information. And for those of you who are watching the stream who may not know about the tavern, I will be including a Discord link to the tavern. So I'll be posting that in there now. Feel free to join the Ch Chili's Tavern. It's a great place to hang out, talk about anything that's you know, game-related or just anything in general. This is not tied to any particular game. It's just a place to hang out, make friends, and have fun. We will also add that link when we post the link. Yep. So. 
All right, we've got our giveaway bot online, and uh, I think it's time for us to try to do that. Okay. So I'm going to fire that off in the main tavern channel. Let's see what happens here. This will be for the um, Metro Exodus 2 pack. Just as a reference to the... Uh, Looks like Lithic was picked. Lithic, get us back a go. win in all caps. 60 seconds, buddy. Just type win in the channel. We'll watch it for it even in the stream if that's where you're at. Go ahead and type the capitals win. And look at that. Lithic there he goes. Won. Boom. Congratulations. Congratulations, Lithic. I'm going to go ahead and get with you after the giveaways. I'll be doing some text chatting with you so we can get that over to you in Steam. We've probably got to be, make buddies if we haven't already. I usually have a, pretty much everybody on my on my Steam. So congratulations. This... And uh, let's go ahead and move into the next little giveaway here. And this is for a $50 Steam gift card. Use it on whatever you want. Hey, maybe that Exodus game that's coming out. Or whatever. You can save it, add it to whatever, buy your favorite tchotchke and Fortnite, whatever it is you choose to do. $50 Steam giveaway up for grabs now. Anyone Zap. who also... Ha. Oh, Zach, there you go. <laughs> Any, anyone anyone who has any uh, requ like requests for stuff, topics we can cover, we can always discuss it outside of the, uh, outside of the stream. If you can give us links and information to yeah, what you suggest definitely. that we can look at. Zap1, he definitely ty typed in on time. This is excellent. You guys followed the clues. You had to add your role. You guys are winning here. Zap has got 50 bucks coming his way directly after we're done here. We're about to wrap up. Again, to reiterate, give us some topics you want to talk about, you guys. That's what we're trying to do. Okies has a lot of information on the industry. Triad has a lot of information on the industry. I've been around a little bit. Everybody calls me yeah. old. I if, you, if, you, so. if you give me a, a topic that... Yeah, a little bit of information on a topic you're requesting or what you want to talk about, and I can just dig up some more information on it. That's right. There was another topic that I was going to push, but I pushed it down to here. Um, there was a topic about EA cancelling yet another Star Wars game. Oh, well, let me get this oh. last. Let me get this last winner done, and uh, we'll cover that a little bit starting now. So, this is for the 120 millimeter magnetically levitated RGB colorized Corsair triple pack of fans and while that doesn't sound super cool unless you're a nerd all the way the nice thing about it is magnetic lib means it's not going to blow its bearings like it would normally have it also means it's quieter which is really nice they have the ability to run off your motherboard's normal four pin headers so that you know they can speed up or slow down and then they have an rgb connection that goes to a little controller so you get a little app and you can make them pulsate or rainbow effects or just stay one solid color i use them in my own computer I got this nice red glow to this black case. It's my color theme is red and black. Hot little product. Here we go. We're going to pick this winner now, too. Holy crap. Well, Zap, oh. you better jump on it, buddy. <laughs> there you go, buddy. Double prize winner. That's right. And it can happen. Everybody's allowed. Everybody can uh, be part of this. So, Zap, you better get your little win in there again if you want this. Or we're going to pick someone else. Type it, Zap. Now, what was that subject you were trying to cover there, Okies? So, th there were two games being developed currently for Respawn and Visceral. Now, one of the games is currently still being worked on, but the other game, which was considered a story mode game that turned into an open sandbox, has now been completely... And the referred title now has been rumored that it's going to be a mobile game for Star Wars. Oh. Man, they have so, mishandled that IP so badly. And, and this is the thing. They've done a 10-year deal, and the only game so far that they produced was both Battlefront games, and that's it. And just as a reference, the last time that the, the last group of companies that had to deal with uh, LucasArts, in the same period of time, there were 28 games that were released. That's, that's so crazy to think that. We used to have... A golden age of Star Wars, where the the IP would just go out to a company that proved that they could make a game and would go and make a game, and while they wouldn't necessarily well, always be the greatest, they'd still e come out with some pretty good stuff. EA undercut every other company through Disney to to get this property. Oh, that man. was the thing. Hey Disney, can you just can you just hire me and I'll and I'll just pick the companies that are allowed to make your games? <laughs> like I can make sure your story's in line, and games. we'll just. That that movies and everything at this point. Yeah, just just let me let me let me let me be in charge of that. Well, no, no, I don't even have to be in charge of like the movies and all that stuff. Just let me be in charge of the game part. I can pick. That, that's easy for that me to pick. That actually might be a topic to for make. next month as well. That I'm gonna. Oh, yeah. topic, which was on. Um, 
guys, I want to go ahead and say thank you to you guys. I want to thank, you know, Okies and Trad for being in this, for helping out and uh, helping to bring these subjects to to everybody listening in and participating in this. We're going to be watching for all your feedback and growing this channel as it should happen. Special credits go out to Jerry Rig Everything for providing that panel wall. Um, Linus Tech Tips for that Alienware piece. And a name I can't pronou pronounce for that beautiful little blizzard question. Is this uh, April Fools? <laughs> and I want to definitely send a special thanks to everybody at the Tavern for joining in and being part of this for the better part of the 2018 and now into 2019. We look to grow yeah. this thing. We look to become bigger, give you more all the time. Just let us know what we can do to give you more enjoyment, have more fun things to do. Just tell us. We're here listening. And with that, extra, I want to... Go ahead. Extra excerpts go out to Kotaku, uh, P, uh, Screen Rant, and PC Gamer for the excerpts we used from the news coverage for Blizzard. Absolutely. We'll get those in the credits too. And again, you guys, let us know. Thank you for joining us. And we're going to go offline now. We're going to go ahead and publish this up to YouTube for anybody who couldn't join us. Sorry if you couldn't. Hopefully you can next time. For now, thank you. Take care. And that's Tavern Talks. Okay, the Sayonara. Stream the stream is stopped. All right.